Well, welcome everybody that is here uh, to Win Feline Foundation's incredible and fun webinar. Uh, I'm really excited about what we have for today. I'm going to give just a couple minutes, uh, well, really a few seconds, for some of our attendees to finish downloading, go to webinar, and join our meeting. But I would take love to take this time to remind folks that the Win Feline Foundation does, in fact, fund studies that help every cat every day uh, in uh, research that has helped to better understand, treat, and many folks would say cure things like FIP, um, how we better treat cats in shelter situations, how breeders can better house and care for their cats to reduce disease. What are those unique traits and uh, morphological aspects of domestic cats that we see and can better understand how those traits are inherited so that if we want to make more because we think it's pretty we can and if we don't want to make any more because it causes some problem we know how better to reduce and eliminate those things from feline populations this is going to be great i'm excited uh, it looks like we have 147 people here with us now. Thanks for just joining us. Leslie Lyons is here. I saw her already this morning. And Win Feline Foundation is really fortunate to have a terrific staff that help pull things like this off with a minimal amount of experts from folks like me. So I'm going to wait for uh, just a five or six more seconds and get the go ahead from my good colleague, uh, Virginia Rudd who is on staff at the Wind Feline Foundation, and uh, Lisa, who's got a beautiful last name, they'll try not to slaughter, Salvaggio uh, in New Jersey. All right, so we've got 152 people here, so I think it's worth starting. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining our webinar this morning. I think it's probably a good place to start is here on the highway. And for those of you who are not from the uh, DMV, the District of Columbia, Maryland or Virginia, this may seem silly, but this is Highway 270. It's uh, when I was uh, just graduating high school, this was the largest highway and the furthest away that I'd ever traveled. And the reason I was on that long, busy highway, <laughs> at least I thought it was, was to visit a uh, woman who I'd spoken with on the phone who was doing research in cat genetics. And I was interested in Bengal cats and breeding cats. I'd already bred Samasa cats and American bobtails. And this woman I talked to on the phone said she had dedicated her career and significant intellectual pursuit to better understanding feline genetics. It was a pivotal moment in my life. And just like the highway, uh, that highway 270 is connected to the rest of the United States interstate system. I learned that feline genetics, uh, that interest in it, putting two animals together to better understand what the offspring would be, was connected to so much of the rest of how we understand science and implement it into our lives, apply it to how we see the world and interact with it. So that is the subject of our lecture or webinar today, The Path to Progress, The Future of Feline Genetics. Where is that highway leading us? And for you guys, you're in luck because the uh, highway led me that day to that young woman standing just behind Judy Sugden, who is uh, the creator of Toyger Cats. At that point, Toygers were a distant dream. <laughs> and uh, the face of that woman is Leslie Lyons. And this is taken at NIH as one of the research institutions. Uh, and this was before selfies, or I would have included myself in the image. And there's Dr. Lyons there at work in her lab in Fort Detrick, Maryland at NIH. And uh, it was a revelation to me. That highway led me to her. And for me personally, it influenced how I bred Bengals, how I understood the uh, pedigreed cat world, what its value of putting two cats together were and are to me. It enriched my relationship with Jean Mill, who created the Himalayan cat uh, through her understanding of feline genetics at the time. And here at Jean, who passed away just about two years ago, uh, that's at her 91st birthday party three years ago. And Jean introduced me to her next door neighbor, 
who I wrote a paper on my senior year of high school. That's Merrily, Merrily Evers Williams, who when I was in high school was the chair of the NAACP and talk about small world and full circle moment. It continued to uh, engage me intellectually and here I am attending uh, where Dr. Lyons was one of the presenters at the uh, Canine Feline Genetics and Genomics Conference in Bern, Switzerland just last year. Uh, and there is part of the community that Dr. Lyons has been a leader of for so long, since I met her actually, uh, of feline and canine geneticists around the world. So that road also brought you guys here because Dr. Lyons has not only been busy, she uh, studying cats, leading research, but she's been writing. I'd include all the papers where her name is cited as an uh, author or co-author or uh, investigator, but it would just fill up the screen. So you can see some there that talk about color, uh, history, uh, some of the uh, variant traits or mutations we see in uh, cat breeds like hairlessness and sphinx, the Rexy and Devon Rex, chocolate and uh, cinnamon, even russet for all my um, uh, Thai friends um, and cow money friends. All these really cool traits that Dr. Lyons has participated in. At the top, you see JSN of the Journal of um, at the Journal of uh, the Association of uh, Society of Nephrology. That is a human uh, scientific journal for interest in kidney disease. And you can see they've cited her there because of her work in polycystic kidney disease. For my Persian and British short hair friends, that has revolutionized how we keep their cats and their breed healthy and stable and continuing into the future. Well, without further ado, let's see this, uh, get a chance to learn more about this incredible person who I got a chance to meet so many years ago. But don't forget that we have an incredible donation that has been shared with the Wind Feline Foundation so we can keep doing this research and funding Leslie, um, a match of $1,500. So if you text CATS, that's CAT, CATS to 833-985-2287, to donate to Win Feline Foundation, the first $1,500 in donations will be matched so that we can do, raise $3,000. This is incredible. I'd love to outdo that, but let's at least get three grand to today so that we can continue to fund research studies by Dr. Lyons and her colleagues around the world to improve the way that cats live and how much and how long we get to enjoy them because there's hardly anything better. Now, without further ado, I will introduce you to Dr. Leslie Lyons. Doc, you can go ahead and share your screen and let folks see you. Or we can look at all these cute little cat faces and their cute little eyeballs. Oh, wait, there you are. I see you. Hey, Leslie. Hey, what's rocking, Anthony? <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. Do we, can the uh, viewers see the, um, presentation at this point. We can see it. It looks great. All right. Sounds good. So let's get this show on the road. Thank you everyone for joining us this Thursday afternoon. Hopefully everyone is having a wonderful day. It's a beautiful day here in Columbia, Missouri. And um, so I'm speaking to you from the University of Missouri and you will notice I am a professor of comparative medicine. So um, most of my work is focused on using the cat to help identify different things about biology of mammals that help us understand both human medicine and cat medicine. So anything we identify in the cat will actually help us to understand the biology of human beings and other species as well. And so, um, Look forward to this presentation today. As Anthony mentioned, we are going to, uh, let's get the cursor in the right place here. We do have a matching support today for the Wind Feline Foundation. I would like to point out that the Wind Feline Foundation was one of the first places I ever got grant funding uh, for. So I wrote my first grant when I was at the National Institutes of the Health. And even though that was an intramural program, 
um, really, I started writing grants at that point in time. And the first project we ever wrote on was um, looking at genetic diversity in Havana Browns. And then we moved on to looking at the cranial facial defect in Burmese cats. And then ever since that time, I've constantly been supported by the Wynn Feline Foundation. I appreciate their help. So you can donate to Wynn today. You can also donate directly to the lab. If you go to our website, you can uh, directly donate to the laboratory as well through the Missouri Give Direct uh, website. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, as Anthony mentioned, it's been a long history. I, I realized that I started out, I would give presentations to cat breeders and it'd be one easy hour lecture and I could say most everything that I knew about cats. And now at this point, it takes several lectures to a day's worth of lecture to be able to present all the different aspects that we've been able to discover over the years on domestic cats and also wild felids as well. So I'm going to start today's discussion with a little bit of history about cats and a little bit of history about genetics and tell you what teachings we have learned from cats. And we'll move into the current state of the science, how we got to where we are today, and eventually we'll chat about uh, what the future lies and, and where we want to go. What's the bit next big hurdles uh, for discovering diseases in our domestic cats. Well, let's start with our fathers of genetics and our father of evolution, Gregor Mendel and Charles Darwin. I just had a student uh, over the past year that came in and she was lamenting that they were, she was lamenting her genetics class and I was asking her how it was going and she said, oh, you know, they talked about this old monk guy and peas. How boring can you get? And I, I think I had my first heart attack or stroke on that day. But uh, in the end, I kind of explained to her who Gregor Mendel was in a little, a little more detail. Um, but he certainly is our father of genetics. Back in the 1800s, he was examining the breeding of pea plants. And that helped us to understand that uh, there was something called independent assortment, which I'll show you what that is, and that these genes all segregated into independently. And he primarily worked on the simple modes of inheritance. And so we call them that, the Mendelian laws of inheritance. And he primarily uh, focused on dominant inheritance as well. So that then led um, Charles Darwin was also independently uh, really a geologist, re, really a geologist, and he took a ride on the HMS Beagle to be their naturalist, which was supposed to be a two-year voyage and ended up being some five years or so. But notice he didn't get around to publishing his ideas on the origin of the species for a good 20 years later. He was just kind of gathering information uh, for his ideas and actually someone else came up with the same idea and so that kind of forced him to get his publication out. But I really am pleased that Charles Darwin was one of the first patrons of domestic cats. Um, so he certainly gave us the ideas of natural selection, survival of the fittest, that evolution is non-Lamarckian. Lamarckian uh, heredity means, okay, if you're a giraffe and you keep stretching your neck up further to get leaves, well, the next offspring will then have longer necks. That's not quite how it works, but um, he is certainly our father of evolu evolution. And here's proof. I, I love this little clipping that uh, a fine gentleman named John Smithson provided to me. And here it actually documents that Darwin was at the first cat show in 1871. And he's looking at the polydactyl cats. And it says, there was this extraordinary cat with seven claws, a strange monstrosity, uh, which was the serious attention of, Dr. of Mr. Darwin. And so um, he was particularly interested in how these claws were being inherited. And now we do know that polydactyl is a dominant mutation. And then by 1873, he's actually a patron for the cat shows. So um, he went on to support cats. And what he was looking for was more evidence to support his theories. So cats were right there from the very beginning. Other early landmarks in genetics is by 1869, 
uh, we actually have the first discovery that there's an acid in the nucleus of cells, which is actually the discovery of DNA. And then 1889, uh, Hugo de Breeze, he actually was one of the people that helped rediscover Mendel's um, publications. And uh, he coined the word genes, pan genes is what he called it at the, at the time, and the word mutation. And then we had uh, interesting discoveries that, hey, there's chromosomes, but it's not until Thomas Hunt Morgan later actually figured out the genes are on the chromosomes and he figures out X linkage. And our first genetic maps come around uh, 1911, working with fruit flies. By 1953, that's actually when we discover the structure of DNA, but it's not till um, from 1990 to 2003 is the first earnest sequencing of the human genome, which at the time cost us about $2.7 billion. And we'll see that it's much cheaper now, but um, it's, it's a lot of fun that we can do this in cats as well. So where do cats fit in here? Well, in 1871, you have the first cat show. So that's overlapping these early discoveries. In 1889, we see people actually trying to evaluate how the Manx gets its tail. Is that a dominant or recessive inheritance pattern? And uh, by 1912, about the same time that Thomas Hunt Morgan is discovering sex linkage, uh, Leonard Doncaster is also looking at sex linkage in tortoiseshell cats. So actually the tortoiseshell cat with orange being on the X chromosome, that represents one of the first loci that is mapped in any species uh, onto a particular chromosome. So it would be the X chromosome. So cats have been right there from the very beginning as far as being important to the development of genetics. Here we have um, karyotypes of the cat chromosomes. So this is what they look like when they're um, going through mitosis. And so, um, and that's cell division. And so we see that cats have 38 different chromosomes. That's different from humans. And later we'll discover that this, these arrangements, we're just kind of starting to discover this now. We've always wondered why are the chromosomes arranged differently? The same genes are on the cat chromosomes as human chromosomes, but they're just arranged slightly differently. And of course, the sequence level is slightly different. So at the sequence level, there's about 10 to 15 percent uh, difference between the sequence identity in humans as compared to cats. Um, but the genes are, are rearranged a little bit as well. We are now discovering that perhaps those rearrangements are important to the to the regulation of different genes uh, across different species. So that's these chromosomal differences help make uh, regulation of genes different and then help make a species different from one another. Just to show you uh, what dogs look like, dogs look like a bit of a dog's breakfast. They have a whole bunch of little chromosomes that are very hard to distinguish from one another. And um, so they're, they're actually a little more shuffled around. So for carnivores, cats actually represent more of what carnivore chromosomes look like and dogs are a bit of an outlier. However, one thing I do want to mention is our Asian leopard cat, because we know those cats are used in breeding Bengal cats. We can see that they're about 6.7 to a little more, little less years of evolutionary time between a, a domestic cat and an Asian leopard cat. That's about the same type of distance between, say, a human and a chimpanzee. Maybe a chimpanzee might be a little more distant. So that's telling you that there's already going to be a 1%, 2% difference in the sequence between a domestic cat and an Asian leopard cat. And so we can see that their chromosomes are slightly different. We look at um, right here, the Asian leopard cat has a little chromosome here that's not matching up with anything we find in humans. And the F1 chromosome doesn't have a pair. So probably the genetic information that's on a chromosome that we call E4 in the Asian leopard cat matches up with the F1 chromosome in the domestic cat. But because of this uh, incompatibility here, that's 
partially the reason why the F1 males are sterile uh, because probably a lot of their cell division gets disrupted with these chromosomes not matching up perfectly. But we do see some of the differences and one good example, we now have a good example, is looking at the charcoal bengal. So the only difference between a charcoal bengal and one that's not is that we have a combination of the normal Asian leopard cat DNA sequence, which we give it this allelic designation. Um, so this is the agouti locus. And then we have the non-agouti domestic mutation. So when the cat has this genotype, we actually have this appearance of the charcoal bengal here. And that's only occurring because there is genetic differences between the bengal cat and the domestic cat that is due to evolutionary time. Now we were talking about independent assortment. So when Mendel was looking at his peas, actually some of the traits that he did look at we're on the same chromosomes. So when we mention independent assortment, what that means is each one of these chromosomes segregates into cell division independently of any other one. So, and then plus, remember you have two of each, one from mom, one from dad, and those segregate independently. So you might get mom's chromosome A1, but dad's chromosome A2. So that's how genes get all shuffled around and that's good. That's what creates genetic variation in one individual to another. So fortunately for Mendel, when he was looking at his traits, a few of them actually were on the same chromosomes in, um, in the P, the P has 14 different chromosomes, but they were far enough apart that when you have genes that are at the opposite ends of chromosomes, they still will independently assort as well. And that's because of a mechanism called recombination, which we won't be discussing today. But basically each arm of a chromosome, the P arm and the Q arm, actually tend to segregate about independently. And on this image here, we have the positioning of all the different traits that have already been localized in cats that you can get genetic testing for. And really none of them are close enough together that they would be uh, what we would call coupled or linked. So they all independently assort. One of the first studies I ever worked on was looking at blindness in Persian cats. And what we know is, and the breeder got a lot of heat about having blind cats because she also had chocolate Persians. And so we know chocolate is associated with the mutation TYRP1, uh, uh, tyrosine related protein one. And we know that that is on a completely different chromosome than the gene that causes Persian blindness, which is AI, uh, AIPL1. So they completely independently assort and that poor breeder just got got a lot of heat for no reason. They weren't associated, the, the blindness was not associated with the coat color in this case. Now I do want to mention that the uh, Persian, the Bengal blindness, the PRA uh, uh, in Bengal cats, the KIF, it's a gene called KIF3B, that now has just uh, been published and it's in the journal called the American Journal of Human Genetics. And it is very important because this is the first time this gene was associated with blindness. And also it's teamed up in that paper with a few presentations on humans. The thing is the humans couldn't actually really, really prove that this gene caused the mutation, but because we had supportive data from the cat, it really helped to sell that study and really helped to prove that this KIF3B gene it can actually cause inherited in blindness in humans. So um, 38 different chromosomes in the cat, one set, of course, is the X and the Y. And we're going to talk a little bit about orange here because that was one of the first things that got cats involved with um, genetics. So what we would need to remember is mammals generally make only about two different pigments, uh, eumelanin and melanin. And a cat's hair is actually banded or what we might call ticked. And it's ticked with bands of black and then bands of yellow and, and bands of black. 
when we have the orange mutation, it actually affects the eumelanin. I think maybe it affects the pheomelanin as well. I'm not quite sure about that, but it makes those into a different tone of color. So it affects both of these pigments, making the cat look orange, or sometimes the color is called red, uh, ginger, and even sometimes it's called yellow. And then of course we have inhibitor, which is a gene that knocks out uh, completely the pheomelanin in cats. Cats are really cool because this ticking makes the hair look brown. So a cat is actually an optical illusion. They don't have brown fur whatsoever. The stripes are black, but the rest of the hair in between is ticked, black, yellow, black, and you can have more or less ticking and this band length can be different. So that will change a bit of the appearance of the cat. And so this is what we call wild type. This is a cat that has um, stripes and is a normal brown tabby. I know this is a domestic cat, otherwise it could look very much like a European wildcat because it has this little white locket here and we're going to talk about that as well and that's the kit white uh, probably involved with kit but we're not quite sure but this is a sign of a cat's domestication. So why do cats have all these fun things with coat colors? Well certainly it's because of camouflage and have you been able to find the kitty down here yet? Uh, so this just goes to show you, there he is right there, that camouflage is quite good with these cats and that's why they have these variations in color. However, some of these variations in color would probably not do well in the wild. I think silver would probably would do very well because it looks like kind of like urban, urban camouflage as well. But um, some traits might not do as well in the wild, but cat breeders and with domestication, we've developed what's called novelty selection. We find something new and we hold on to that and produce a breed out of that, which is also known as a form of artificial selection. And so um, we see that a lot of our breeds are not developed because of natural selection, but because of artificial selection. But many of the mutations do occur naturally. And many of the mutations actually that control coat colors and fur types did occur before cats were developed into breeds. So many of these colorations probably occurred during the domestication process that once people realized cats were handy to have around, they started perpetuating some of these odd colors that you tend not to see in the wild. <clears throat> so back to our tortoiseshell cats. This is actually a good friend of mine, their, their tortoiseshell cat, Hermione. Um, this is a very interesting coloration because oddly, it is specific to cats. I mentioned earlier that most all the genes that are, we find in mammals are consistent, whether you're a human, a cow, a pig, a dog, or a cat, we all have the basic 20,000 genes or so. Where we do differ is how many we genes we have, say, for smell and for the ability to pick up pheromones as well. So we know those groups of genes expand and contract. Um, but overall, mostly we all have the same genes. So X, the X chromosome is very, very well conserved. So it's very unusual that the cats have some mutation that's on the X that causes this odd coloration. So this was one of the first traits to be mapped. It's X-linked inheritance, but then it also teaches us something called X inactivation, which by the way, was discovered by a person named Mary Lyon, and the process is called lionization. I have traced my own geo genealogy all the way back to uh, the beginning of time. I would like to be able to come forward and show that I was actually related to Mary Lyon in some way, but uh, something to do for the future. So that would be really cool. But also, this is an example of how epigenetics works as well. And then we always have been wondering, is there some type of behavioral association with um, tortoiseshell cats, which some people call tortitude. So let's talk a little bit about X inactivation. So X inactivation is a process where methylation, so this is an epigenetic effect um, that occurs to inactivate one of the two X chromosomes that are found in women. Um, so that is, that occurs so that the protein expression is more balanced 
uh, with a male so that we're producing about the same amount of protein with a male by turning one off one of our X chromosomes. This occurs very, very early in embryonic development and it occurs randomly. But once it occurs in one specific cell lineage during development, it is consistent throughout that cell. So when you see tortoiseshell cats, their orange and black doesn't switch around. So one X chromosome must have the mutation that causes orange and the other X chromosome must have no mutation. So it's wild type and that allows the normal black coloration to show up. So we're just actually discovering what this gene is doing. We now do know the mutation, but researchers are following that up of how does that actually work because it's unique to the cats again. Now this X inactivation uh, can also get displayed that it this inactivated X will then go and get out of the way and it actually binds to the cell wall. And if you stain those cells um, with different dyes, they will actually fluoresce brightly. And that's called the bar body. And so here we see an image of a bar body. And that was actually used early in human genetics and say in sports to actually prove um, your gender, whether you were male or female, you would actually look for the bar body. And that would tell you that you had two X's. Now, one an anomaly that's very important is that sometimes we see male cats that are tortoiseshell or calico. And when you look at the chromosomes of those cats, a lot of times you will see that they're either XXY. So this is an abnormality. They have too many sex chromosomes. So they either have an extra Y or an F extra X. And because of the cells not sure what they, they're going to do, most of the time these cats are infertile. Or a cat can be actually a chimera. So you'd have to do the karyotype of a cat to be able to figure out which one it might be. So um, tortoiseshell male cats or calico male cats can uh, have chromosomal abnormalities and can't be, can't, can be called uh, chimeras as well. We've seen an interesting cat as Venus. Uh, Venus is interesting. People are thinking, oh, here's a chimera cat. Well, probably not because Venus was a female and she did have a fine uterus and everything, although she is spayed at this point. But what is interesting for this cat to me is that look at her head. She has some white spotting going on. So is she a calico? Is she a torty? The rest of her body looks torty, but probably this white spotting helps to initiate this big patch of black and a big patch of orange. So overall, everything can be explained about Venus that she's kind of a normal torty cat with a little bit of an anomaly. But what's interesting to me is that her blue eye is actually on the orange side. And, um, and so that might have to be um, associated with this white spotting here. So very cool looking cat, but unfortunately uh, she has been proven to not be a chimera. So why do we get these big patches of coloration in some tortoiseshell cats? Um, and that's primarily because of the association of white. So when a tortoiseshell also has white, then we call it a calico. And that's because of the gene known as KIT. And this is actually a cancer causing gene, but it is present in many, many species and mutations in this gene are associated with white spotting in horses and dogs and pigs and also in humans as well. One of the simplest mutations we have in this gene is just two amino acid changes can lead to the white gloving that we find in in Burmans, which is a recessive trait. You need to have two copies of that to be present. But that is different than the mitted that we find in ragdolls. So there are some ragdolls that have uh, apparently been bred with Burmans and have do, do have this mutation. But ragdolls seem to have some other mutation that is not found yet. So again, why, do this, why does this cause these big patches? Um, so what we have to realize is during development, melanocytes come from melanoblasts. Those are precursors of melanocytes. A melanocyte is a cell that produces melanin. They all divide, come from what's called the neural crest cells. 
So during embryolic, em, during the development of the embryo, the neurocrest cells are kind of along our spinal cord and they migrate from the spinal cord from the back. They go from the back, they move sideways and then they come around to the underbelly and they meet in the midline. And your midline is right down the middle of your body um, on, the, on the side where your belly button is. So your belly button marks your midline. And so when the cells are migrating, if they don't quite make it to the midline, you might not have melanocytes present. And so if there's no melanocyte, you get no pigment and then you get a white spot. So um, many of the lockets and belly spots that you see on cats, those are right at the midline. And so those are midline closure defects and they're very common. So cleft lips and umbilical hernias, uh, those are also midline closure defects. We see that those are common in humans, but they can be genetic or they can cause, be caused by environmental uh, abnormalities as well. Now, melanocytes don't only make pigment in the skin. They are important for pigment in the eye as well. So they um, uh, populate the iris and that leads to the pigmentation of the iris. When you don't have enough melanocytes in your iris, you actually have two layers of pigmentation in your eye, then you tend to have blue eyes. So if you have uh, missing one of those layers or just not enough melanocytes there to produce pigment. We don't make blue pigment. We actually make pigment and because of the thickness of the eye and, and the layers of tissue that the uh, wave wavelengths have to go through, this actually transforms to this to looking blue, just like the sky is blue as well. And then in the back of the layer, uh, back of the eye is the tapetum. That's the reflective layer in the cat as well. And that will take up melanocytes and they're specialized and they pick up zinc and that helps with eye shine. So you'll actually see that a cat with blue eyes will have a red eye shine where a cat with normal colored eyes will have um, more of a yellow green eye shine as well. And that's because there's melanocytes that uh, there aren't there that um, do are not helping to form that reflective layer in the uh, tapetum. Now these melanocytes also migrate to the inner ear in, in the cochlea. And so those cells also there help with our hearing. So these melanocytes have multiple roles. That's called pleiotrophism. They go to many different tissues. So one cell has many different functions in the body. And so we see that mutations in the gene for kit alters the production of the number of melanocytes or it disrupts the migration of those melanocytes. So if we have a migration disruption, we have melanocytes that are produ produced along um, at the neural crest and they migrate they seem to run out of gas and don't make it all the way to the ventral, the bottom side of the cat. And so that's why one copy of a mutation for white spotting will lead to a bicolor cat. If you have two copies, then you tend to just have melanocytes that are populating the tail and the head. And sometimes you'll see some spots uh, throughout the rest of the cat. This is a gene, this is called co-dominant expression, one copy, leads to more pigmentation than two copies do. But this is also a gene that explains variable expression. So not only is there a mutation, but also there's random effects of where those cells migrate to, or maybe it has to do with some other mutations that are present in the body as well, which maybe we can start to figuring out what those may be now that we know what the main mutations are as well. When we have a dominant white cat, it seems like the disruption to the kit gene is more severe, disrupts more of the melanocytes. You might just get a few that for a skull cap right here of, of pigmented hairs here, but um, that's more likely when we will see cats that have either blue eyes or an odd eyed blue cat. And the cat that has the side that has the blue eyes tends to 
mean that there's been less melanocytes migrating there. And so likely the cat could be deaf as well on the blue eyed side. So we'll, this is very old data. No one's done a newer study, um, but of 60% of blue eyed white cats, often about 40% of those are deaf. You could have a cat with has a uh, hearing and actually only one ear. And the thing is you'd have to actually do bear testing that to figure that out or not. So often when we do hearing studies, people want to say, hey, well, can we find out the genetics of why only some proportion of cats are deaf? The thing is we have to do the due diligence of making sure the cats can hear in both ears. And uh, so we have to do bear testing. But with the new genetic high density DNA array, DNA array that we will discuss, maybe we'll be able to find out some of these um, perhaps uh, modifying genes that affect deafness. So, uh, so these are called uh, dominant white, also is an example of pleiotrophic effects affecting several different tissues. This is a dominant mutation. This is a phenocopy with a cat that could be an albino cat that is due to a mutation in a different gene, uh, tyrosinase. So we know there's several mutations in tyrosinase that can lead to an all white cat. So the only way you'd be able to tell them genetically apart is by doing breedings or doing a genetic test. And so this is an example of a phenocopy. And then what plagues geneticists? We got to make sure with every disease that we study that we are always collecting cats that are have the same condition for the exact same reason. So we're always looking for what's called uh, phenocopies or something called disease heterogeneity. You have more than one reason to cause a disease. Another good example to show you variable expression is found in our blue cats. Now we have a couple different breeds that are just um, always blue, the Russian blue, the Korot, the Chartreux, and then the British Shorthair uh, blue is very popular for that breed as well. This is one mutation in the gene called melanophyllin. But notice, this is not optical illusion from the pictures. These cats are really different tints of blue or different shades of gray. So um, we see that there must be modifier genes that affect discoloration. So what I'm trying to point out is that even though we know some very basic mutations that turn colors on or off, we see that other genes of the body all interplay with our presentations, our phenotypes and our health. So it shouldn't be a surprise that most of the time with our health, most genes are very, uh, most of our health is very complex. It's an interplay of many different genes. In this case, it's just a simple coat color and changes the tint a little bit, but later we'll see that there's probably modifier genes that affect many different aspects of our health. Now, uh, dilution is one of my favorite things because this is too an optical, uh, illusion. These cats do not produce blue or gray pigment. So what's actually happening is when you have a hair, you should have your pigment uh, put down in little very even packages that are in a very regular presentation. But when you have a dilute hair, actually these pigment packages get clumped up and unevenly distributed. And so just be because of the reflection of the light through the hair shaft, these cats actually look like they're blue or gray. So they only have black pigment or a cream would uh, be an orange cat, but because of this clumping of the pigment, it creates the optical illusion of a lighter colored cat. Now overall, um, if you actually think about the alphabet, you can go through the alphabet and think about all the different coat colors and presentations that we have in cats. A is for agouti, B for brown, C for color, D for dilute, and so on. And if you add in some of the health aspects like F is for fold, you can actually go through about 26 to 30 different single gene mutations that we have identified in the cats. So most color variations have been, uh, most of the 
typical ones that we have worked with have been identified. You, everyone knows I'm working on silver and we're kind of right on top of it, but just trying to prove which mutation. We have a couple candidate mutations of which one is right, or maybe they're both right. Uh, orange has been identified. A couple groups have identified ticked at this point, so we should be here about hearing about these in the in the coming months or so. Um, one a uh, gene mutation that I don't think we have identified yet is wideband. Perhaps there's other groups uh, working on that. If you're interested in wideband, we're actually going to call it variable wideband. So this stands for V, variable wideband. And you can see that the cats still have ticked hair, but the length of the pheomelanin band is a bit long, is longer. It can be very long where you just have a very short tipped uh, hair like you'd see in this chinchilla cat here where it can be shorter um, and, and, and can be actually very short. So it plays games with uh, what these cats actually look like. So this is a very interesting gene that I don't think has been studied yet. There's now, now that the common normal ones have been identified, and we can probably genetically type a cat for all the normal stuff, that will now allow us to go look for more difficult genes such as dilute modifier. Does that really exist? Is this just a poor colored dilute cat? Or is there some type of modification in this cat, another gene mutation that is causing this cat to look more brown than the, the normal kind of blue? We're starting to see other presentations from cats as we have more cats coming from Eastern Europe and China and Russia, where the cat fancy breeds are really taking off. We should be expecting to see new genetic mutations, such as blue-eyed cats that are pretty much all black. They may or may not have a little bit of white associated with them. So this is probably a new mutation, whether we call it Ojos Azules or, or Topaz cats. Um, these are new fun things that we can be studying. The copper cats, these are very interesting. We know that there's different mutations and extensions, so we would need to type all these cats for genes that cause some cats to be a lighter red type of color. And, um, and then also we need the silver to also type for these cats before we start figuring out well, which cats are truly copper or which cats are phenocopies, which cats are lookalikes. So these projects are a little harder because we have to do all the baseline genetics first and make sure we're putting all copper cats together and all non-copper cats together in order to do a genetic study. A few other little interesting coat colors as well. Pulled this off a of messy beast, this interesting black and white cat. We always have to wonder, is this genetic or is this some other health aspect that's going on with these cats? And basically there needs to be breedings to be able to reproduce this and show that, demonstrate that you have something just genetically inherited before you would really start on a, a big genetics project to find the mutation. And then we also have kind of the reverse points that's also been noticed as well in the Carpati cats. And hopefully that has been proven to be inherited. And one very interesting thing is these bimetal sunshine cats, I think they're called. And uh, I had one of these cats in our colony as well, where you have cats that seem like um, when they are torties that they have, and silvers, that they have different expression of the silver. And so we're not sure how that's gonna work because silver is not X-linked whatsoever. So why is it interacting in these odd fashions with uh, genes on the X chromosome? So we're gonna take a little pause there for a moment. And I'll remind everyone that you can text to the Wind Feline Foundation and hopefully try to match this $1,500 so that we can um, raise money for the Wynn Foundation, which will promote all health aspects and good research in domestic cats. And you can also donate directly to the lab as well through the MU Give Direct website on our, on our webpage. Okay, so how did we actually get here? How did we get here? Um, so far in the past, we've had to use what's called the candidate gene approach, where we use um, information from other species, mainly mice, to select a gene. So let's look at the agouti gene, sequence it in cats, and find the mutation for the cat. And so this was doing one gene at a time, 
where you didn't even know where that gene lived. You really didn't care. You just gathered the sequence information from a mouse, tried to get your amplification and sequencing to work in a cat, and look for the genetic mutations. That is a tried and true process, and it works. doesn't work all the time. So uh, we've always had to think of, well, if it doesn't work, then what do we do? Well, if you've been around me long enough, at one point in time, we're collecting large families. So large extended families, we've had affected individuals of a given trait. Um, so we started out doing our cranial facial defect in the Burmese cats and polycystic kidney disease in this way, where we got large families and we do an analysis with genetic markers and those markers are all over the genome. So we tend to say genome-wide association studies, but at the time we were trying to do genome-wide linkage analysis, which are generally family-based studies. And that has worked for identifying lots of different mutations as well. Dilution and KIT and inhibitor and TABI, many and many diseases have been identified using linkage analyses. Now, what you have to remember is you never throw these techniques away as you move up and, and have more resources. Currently, we do a lot of association studies, what's called GWAS, genome-wide association studies, where we do cases and controls. So it's basically, we still want individuals from a breed. We can't just uh, mix apples and oranges, so we always have to be careful of pheno phenocopies and disease heterogeneity, where we try to select all the cats that are specific case for something. It can be a coat color or it can be a disease. Those are your cases. And you have to have a cat that's closely related to be the control. So a cat of the same genetics, it doesn't have to be a perfect sibling or a parent, that's always best, but just so it's from the same genetic population. And so we do case control studies with tens to hundreds of thousands of markers. And that has been used to find a hypokalemia, I think was one of the first things we found, and many other diseases have been found that way as well. So we are continuing along with these studies, but we're moving forward with genome sequencing as well. So if you remember, um, when I first started, I was asking for three to six mils of blood from cats um, because we weren't very efficient at PCR at the time. Well, now we're very efficient with PCR and we can do a lot of uh, genetic testing with only 25 nanograms of DNA or so. Um, but what we have to remember when I'm asking for three to six mils of blood, the DNA is found only in the white cells of blood, not in the plasma, not in the red cells, only in this very small fraction. So you might think, oh, we're given a lot of DNA here. Well, actually, no, it's just a little bit. And when we isolate DNA, we're actually not very good of it. With No matter what kit or procedure you use, we're only about 15 to 20 percent efficient. Uh, so still, with a lot of our studies, we ask you for DNA samples from whole blood uh, because that gives us the most amount of DNA. But we can do a lot of studies with buckle swabs as well, whether they're Q-tips or cytological brushes. So if we're doing DNA chip studies, uh, we still can do a lot of work, be able to be very successful with collecting G DNA just from buckle swabs and cytological brushes. So never think that you can't participate in the study because one way or another, we can probably get DNA from your cat. And these buckle swabs can be shipped all over the world at room temperature. They're stored at room temperature, so they're quite handy to have. Okay, so where does our science go from here? Well, currently, I've been focusing on, and when I got to the University of Missouri, we really started up the 99 Lives Cat Genome Sequencing Consortium. There's not a lot of researchers in cats, so we've tried to get everybody to combine all their genomes into one group of cats, uh, one place, and we are pretty much it here at Missouri. We have collected up everybody's cat genomes, and then we uh, do the same type of analysis on every genome, and that allows us to find all the DNA variation that is common and rare in our cats. Sometimes we're looking for common variations. Some of our coat color mutations are very common. But with diseases, we're often looking for rare variations. So this database helps us to figure out what's common and what's rare, and it helps us hone down on what mutations to look for. 
But in the meantime, we have to continue developing better and better resources. So Bill Murphy right now at Texas A&M is working on the development of better uh, genome reference. So a new genome reference assembly for the cat should be coming within the next year or so, which should have a better annotation of genes and where they live on chromosomes and their genetic structure. Um, I help, to, I help uh, Bill a lot with different projects, but then also the community is focusing on doing long read RNA sequencing. RNA helps us to understand what gene, what, what uh, sequences and proteins a given gene makes. So what we have found is that a given gene can make many, many different what's called transcripts, proteins that affect different cells of the body. So one gene might make one transcript in the liver, but a different transcript in the kidney. So when I first started genetics, we thought there was 100,000 genes. But after all these sequencing events, what we have found is there's more like 20 to 21,000 genes, and each gene makes multiple transcripts. So uh, we have to learn and understand those different transcripts. So that means we need to study different cell lines, different tissues uh, to help understand the different transcripts that a gene makes. I'm currently helping to make what's called a high density DNA array. And when we say high density, this will have 650,000 DNA markers that we will use to help do association studies. We've already had a cat chip and that had 63,000. So this is gonna be 10 times denser, and we're hoping that will become a product in the next coming year so that we can start looking for genetic modifiers. So if I wanted to put uh, a, do a case control study, I could put on a bunch of white cats that we have tested for hearing, and we know these cats here, and we have, those would be our controls, and our cases could be a bunch of deaf cats, but we have to make sure we do the same breed and that we have enough cats, and we must have um, the hearing information because you might think your cat hears, but maybe it only hears in one ear. So we have to do the normal cats that we know that, that are probably hearing. We still have to do the bear testing in those cats as well. So this is what we're doing for science to help move cat genetics along, but cat breeders can always still contribute um, by continuing to give DNA samples. We can't do anything without the cat breeder and we need your DNA samples. So one of the newest things going on is trying to develop precision medicine in cats. And what that means is we wanna use the genetic information of the individual cat to help with its diagnosis, and then also to help with its treatment. Because we are learning that depending on the genetics of the individual, you may or may not respond to a given treatment. So everybody is very familiar with this with cancers, that you get your breast cancer type for different markers, and then we'll know what different uh, breast cancer treatment to give you. But that also uh, affects other aspects and how you respond to other treatments as well. So that's what we hope to be pushing forward for domestic cats, precision medicine. This is becoming the state of the art and the normal procedures uh, within humans. So we hope to push this along for cats. So we can do this on an individual cat where we do genome sequencing on an individual cat, and we have several published papers on this already, where a cat comes in, we can't figure out the disease or the diagnosis. They say it might have a, um, it might have an, a lysosomal storage disease. Well, there's dozens of genes that cause that type of condition. So you could sequence each one of those genes by the candidate gene approach, or you could sequence the whole cat and by using the database, help to find the rare mutation that only that cat has that causes its condition. So now the price of whole genome sequencing is so low, it's about 750 to $1,000. And that's just to do the sequencing. That's not all the bioinformatics and analysis part. But nearly anybody can afford to genome sequence their cat now. And if you genome sequence your cat, you can actually find all the mutations. So if you wanted to know every mutation in your cat for the known diseases and coat colors, if you get a genome sequence, you're gonna get that by default as well. 
But even when we do this, this only works about 40 to 50% of the time. And we'll discuss why only 40 to 50% of the time. There's another technique called whole exome sequencing. And if you remember, genes are made up of exons and introns. The exon part of your genes, the coding part, is less than 5% of all the, gene all the DNA in your body. So if we just sequence the exomes, we can do that for much cheaper. Um, it's less, less difficult to analyze, actually. But we'll find the causal mutation in maybe 30, 40 percent of the patients. And that's because we're finding that there are a lot of mutations that are in introns and in between genes that are controlling and regulating genes that are what is causing disease. So, so far, we have been focusing on, as scientists, the coding portions of genes. We're starting to run out of things to look at, and we know certain things have failed. Our failures might very well be mutations that are outside the coding portions of the gene. And so that's why some studies are just more difficult than others, and you never know which one it's, it's going to be. So why does whole genome or exome sequencing fail? Why have you been looking for silver and you can't find it all these years? Well, it's generally because it's probably not in a coding portion of a gene. But if you to start a study, what are some of the reasons that we have to be careful of? Well, well, maybe we're trying to find something genetic and it's not genetic in the first place. Maybe it's been in a bad environmental exposure, just something randomly that has happened to that cat. So we always need, we need to make sure we have good genetic workup on our individuals. The disease might be complex. We might think it's simple, but actually it's a combination of different genetic variations that add up and produce the condition. And this could be a combination of both common and rare different DNA variants. Perhaps we just can't find it because our reference genome is poor or that gene isn't annotated well in a cat. Annotation gets updated constantly. So I constantly reanalyze our data and every once in a while, I'll find a mutation that, that wasn't there before six months. We have the data, but we can't identify it because we don't have the annotation correct in, in the reference genome. We need to have a good set of comparative data. If I start looking at cats, say, from China or Siberia, I don't have a lot of cats like that in the 99 Lives Project. So there might be variants there that I'm going to completely miss because I don't have proper populations represented in the data set. Now, the other reasons we can't find things is sometimes because the causal variants are non-coding or also they could be what's called structural variants. And so if we have whole genome sequencing, at least we have the information to actually try to look for these structural variants. Whole exome sequencing doesn't give us the data to be able to look for these type of things. So that's why you would do whole genome sequencing over whole exome sequencing. Or Sometimes the DNA variant is right there. And the thing is, when you do genome sequencing, you still have tens to hundreds of DNA variants. That could be the potential candidate DNA variant. And perhaps we just don't understand it and we, we can't uh, get to it yet. So a high density DNA array, if we do a project on a high density DNA array, these DNA arrays localize, they find where the mutation might be, what part of the chromo what chromosome and what part of the chromosome. So it narrow down, narrows down where to look. Genome sequencing doesn't narrow. It gives you all the mutations. It will give you the disease mutation, but you don't know where to look in the genome. So high density arrays will say, well, look here. And then that greatly facilitates us being able to find mutations for our whole genome sequencing. So that's why we've gone back to developing a high density DNA array. And that is underway right now. We're isolating DNAs uh, for potential projects for this. So for example, some projects that have failed on whole genome sequencing, very simple things, inherited things like uh, Tennessee uh, Rex, Laperm, wire hairs. These are simple traits that we ought to be able to identify. Uh, the bobtail and the toy bob and toy bobs. 
we can't find them. So they're probably structural variants or non-coding variants. But then also we've tried to do some more complex things such as Bengal polyneuropathy and oral facial pain and Burmese. Um, so we hope to be looking at these things on uh, the high density DNA array. We'll be looking at amyloidosis and the Siamese and the Abyssinians as well. So um, that's what uh, we hope to be doing this summer in our laboratory. So with complex traits, are we headed there? Are we going to be able to look at those? Um, we are, we're hoping, but it's still, it's very hard to study complex traits. These are big money projects, and that's what the holdup has been, is we have to figure out what is the genetic part of a complex trait and what is the environmental part. The genetic part in itself is complex. There might be more than one gene that's involved. So it's a combination of various different genes and the environment. If we were just to think about FIP, the different parts that we have to consider is first off, why do some cats have high coronavirus tires and other cats get low tires? And why do some cats get reinfected by coronavirus and other cats don't? Is there some different resistance to the different strains? So if we did a study on this, we would have to have find the high and the low cats. They'd have to be from the same populations under the same environment. And we'd have to make sure they all had the same strain of coronavirus as well. Out of cats that have high coronavirus titers and have a lot of mutations going on because that titer is high, some of those viruses turn into the FIP virus. Why do some of the cats can't fight that off? And that FIP virus then uh, moves into the macrophages and then it starts to cause FIP. There are some cats that probably have FIP virus, but don't go on to get FIP because we never recognize them. Why do some cats get dry versus wet FIP? So we have to control all the environmental factors and consider all the genetic combinations. So this is most likely probably done with research colonies of cats and it's a very expensive process. So when we talk about complex traits, why have we not just jumped on board and tried to figure out all the genetics of FIP is because it's very expensive to do. And it's very expensive to make little headway with each one of these different questions that we have to tease apart. So that leads us to um, thinking about some of the things that, what can cat breeders do? So that's what I'm doing as far as a geneticist. What can cat breeders do as far as health of their animals as well? And this is the difficult part of the presentation. And this is what I call the slippery slope of breed health. So this might make you a little uncomfortable, but this is the thinking process and this is what you have to consider as a cat breeder and a cat owner. At one end of the slippery slope, we have healthy cats that reproduce normally, that make lots of little babies, live 14 or more years, and eventually die of renal failure of lymphoma as an old age cat. That's a normal cat. But we see a lot of unhealthy problems with our cats, whether they're health or whether they have poor reproduction, we would put those at the bottom end of the scale. That's what we don't want to continue to produce. So if we think about this a little bit, even the things such as simple coat colors, Siamese cats historically have had uh, crossed eyes and uh, so uh, strabismus and nystagmus where the eyes will kind of quiver, shake back and forth. And that's because the mutation in some cats don't allow what's called the formation of the optical chiasma where the nerves from one eye go to both sides of your brain. So your uh, left eye goes to both your left side of your brain and the right side of your brain. Albinistic cats, which means Siamese cats as well and some Burmese cats as well, that optical chiasma doesn't form properly and that leads to some of the um, uh, nystagma and uh, strabismus. We know with our white cats, um, they have hearing uh, problems. So we've known that. These white cats can also um, have a higher susceptibility to melanomas. 
So um, we are starting to breed munchkin cats and munchkin cats, we've looked at those closely. They do not have the back problems that you find in dachshunds. Um, but if we actually look at their legs, this is a normal cat and this is a munchkin cat. So they can have rather severe uh, angular deformities in their cat, in their, in their legs. We've not been able to show a lot of arthritis yet in these cats. They don't have the back problems. So, but we have to be very careful. Can we breed the longest laid dwarf cats as possible so that we don't have these defects? I've been to cat shows where people have been so proud. I got the shortest dwarf cat. That's not what you want. You actually want the longest leg dwarf cat. So if we think about our slippery slope, where do we put these things? Well, deafness and, and cross eyes and lymphomas, we can kind of deal with those. Those aren't the worst things in the world. The cats will probably live a long normal life with that. If they were in the wild, that might not be the same story, but we might put those amongst uh, not the worst things in the world. But if we think about other things like Scottish Fold, this has become a lot of heat in the cat breeding community. We know that many registries won't accept Scottish Folds. We know that we know this mutation now. There might be a modifier that affects the amount of osteochondral dysplasia that occurs. But we know that these cats will have severe problems and lead to stiffness and joint pain um, that you might not even recognize because cats hide their pain very well. We know this can happen in cats that have only one copy of the mutation as well. So um, we need to make sure that um, we breed these cats as healthy as could be. We've known for a long time what goes on with Manx cats. As we saw, Charles Darwin and uh, Leonard Doncaster were looking at Manx cats because these are dominant traits and they wanted to be able to say, hey, I found something too that's genetic. And here it is in cats, something that we see every day, not some type of fruit fly or weird bug, but you know, something that uh, every person can actually see. So we know that Manx causes problems, but this is an accepted breed. And what possibly goes on with these cats is here we have the tail of the cat and then uh, the sacral, sacral bones here. So sometimes the tail is mutation and we can't predict which mutation and how severe this is going to be. So maybe there's genetic modifiers for this as well, that sometimes this will disrupt these bones in the sacrum as well. And where I see these little holes here, each one of your vertebrae have these holes where nerves uh, come out and then go to different organs of your body. So they go from your backbone to the different nerve, to the different organs. And so if this is disrupted, we can have problems with nerves in the S means the sacral uh, uh, vertebrae. And if this is disrupted, we can see that um, nerves go to the bladder or to the lower intestines. So these cats can have lameness, they can have incontinence, they can be constipated, and, uh, and it can be quite severe. So we've known for a long time that if we had to do it all over again, maybe we wouldn't accept Manx as a breed. And the, and the Scottish fold gets a lot of um, heat. So those kind of go at the lower end of the spectrum where we don't want to breed these type of cats that are unhealthy. Other things that fall, if we think about other things that fall into place, we already know Burmese head defect, a recessive condition that's based on making the space um, more brachiocephalic. So one mutation, these are heterozygous cats, homozygous cats, are very severely affected and uh, need to be put down when uh, they're born or some are, are still born. We know we don't like this mutation. We want that to go away. So we put that way down here at the bottom end of the spectrum, feline head defect or neonatal isoerythrolysis. We know we don't want that. So we try not to do that. Here's other diseases that I'm not gonna mention that um, uh, we know are, are down at the low end. We don't wanna breed these. We try to get rid of these mutations. So that leaves me asking you as breeders of how you deal with the things in the middle. How are you gonna deal with ear fold and taillessness and these other mutations as well? Um, they're not as lethal, they're not as bad, but still we have to be 
uh, the guardians of our cats and take care of these different mutations. Um, so I'm going to pause there for a minute and then I'm going to get to um, the last part of our discussion. I see we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so I'll try to make this as short as we can so we have some uh, time to discuss some of the different um, any questions that come up as well. And I will stay on afterwards if anybody wants to ask questions as well. So don't forget to give uh, to the Wind Feline Foundation. So just something fun. What makes a cat a cat? I'm not sure if any of you cat people actually knew this. So what makes a cat a cat is really the auditory bulla here that's at the base of the skull. And so it's it's right under here. And so what makes a cat a cat is really its teeth and this auditory bulla and that it generally has a shorter rostrum than say other carnivores would have. And, um, and of course, then their teeth are very, very specialized. They are a carnivore. I've heard the word used hyper carnivore. Cats use protein as their source for energy. Now we fooled around with these skull structures in uh, our breeding program. So we can see that Persians are very, very brachycephalic, where the opposite end is a dolichocephalic, which is Siamese and Orientals. Um, but we can see there are health problems. And so my question to you is where are we going to put some of these things on that slippery soap of health, health um, for cats? This is what the breeder can control and doesn't have to be up to the scientist to fix. So here's a nice normal looking cat head. Uh, this is my cat Watson. He's a wonderful cat. So what we have to realize is that some of the mutations that affect the facial structure of cats are these things that affect the closure of the sutures, which, you know, when you're a baby, you have a little soft spot. That's because not all your uh, bones have come together in your skull. If these are disrupted, that leads to brachiocephaly in humans. That is called a dysmorphology. That is a problem in humans. But in our cats, we see that when cat breeding kind of started, and here's one of our prized Persian cats in 1899, they had faces that were not as brachycephalic. But then mutations came along and breeding practices changed and we discovered the peak face Persian and that has been popularized. And now we also see something called doll face Persians where they have a very domed head as well. Right. What we know is if you do MRIs of these cats, these cats have uh, hydrocephalus. Um, so we can see here with the CT images how much the uh, rostrum has been shortened in these cats. So that now we have very brachycephalic cats. Why do we consider this normal for cat morphology? Uh, because this would be a so very severe morphology in humans. We can see that basically there's here's a nice normal skull in the cat. We can see that these different doll face and peak face Persians are really just cramming up the brain, leading to other difficulties in these cats. This is not what a cat's brain should look like inside its skull. And there is now a veterinary movement to really try to reduce this. So here we have a Persian right next to a normal cat. And there is a big push from both um, the British Association and the World Small Animal Veterinary Association to try to move against brachycephalic breeds. So we can see this is in cats, this is dogs. There is actually two different dogs there. It occurs in buddy rabbits. For some reason, humans like to push towards brachycephalic uh, presentations. We know this causes problems. In Persian cats, this can lead to poor uh, matching of their upper and lower jaw. And so that can cause these little sores because these teeth are pressing uh, where they shouldn't be into the gums. Uh, these pictures are courtesy of Susan Little. You know, this can cause cherry eye in some of the Burmese cats when the face structure is too small. The, uh, mem the um, Basically, the tear duct gets pushed out of the, out of the cat's eye. Um, other dentition problems that we constantly see in brachycephalic breeds where the jaw is, is undershot as well, and that will lead to malocclusion of the upper and lower jaws. Um, what about this cat? Look at its nose, it's a uh, stenotic nares here. It, it can't breathe out of that. So there's a lot of plastic surgery for cats to help them breathe. Um, this is not normal. 
and we should try to move away from this as cat breeders. Um, you can see that since the tear ducts are pinched down, you have a lot of tearing and overflow that causes this tearing in the cat's face and then uh, bacteria will build up as well. And then that will lead to constant eye infections. And this is called a sequestrum where actually a mineral deposit is developing in the eye. And this, this can lead to basically a big rock forming in the eye. And, and um, part of this is associated with brachiocephalic breeds. So we are causing these problems because we are selecting for faces that are too short. This has been known for a long time in dogs and it's a worse condition in dogs. It actually has a name syndrome because for the dog, the face has been bred too short that even the soft palate in the dog and all the uh, nasal passages and all the, the things up in your sinuses, all that soft tissue is still there. And so that can lead to blockage of the airway in these brachiocephalic dogs. And this also causes an anesthesia complication. We'll generally see this in dogs because they will have exercise intolerance and they can become so overheated that they can die of hyperthermia. So we have to be very careful with this. We don't have the same type of syndrome in cats, but still we should be moving away from these brachiocephalic breeds. So my question to you is where do you put that on this slippery slope? And I hope that is something that we can try to move away from within our cat breeds. So finally, what we need to realize is genetic disease is common. It occurs all the time. Um, so, and it's going to keep occurring. Genetic mutation is good, but every once in a while we have a bad genetic mutation as well. So I expect new mutations to always be occurring in our breeds. Mutations are not caused by breeders, but they're perpetuated by breeders. So it's our job to recognize them and uh, try to keep healthy cats. There's about 17 or so different mutations known in domestic cats in the breeds that cat breeders should actually be testing for. And there's lots of different companies doing this now. So in breeds, there's about 16 different diseases plus all your coat color genes. So actually you have a panel of about 75 different mutations that you should be looking for in cat breeds. Um, we know that genetic testing is becoming more and more common. There's lots of different facilities that will test now. UC Davis VGL, I still work with. I work with Mars Veterinary. Anybody that reaches out to me, I will reach out to them as well. I am not in the commercial testing business. My job is to make sure they do their job as best as possible. And so I often do a lot of background and work and resources to help them do a good job. I don't care about the competition. I want every lab to be as good as they possibly can and uh, be able to give accurate and good results. Through genetic testing, we know that some cat breeds have, are severely inbred and have a high inbreeding coefficients where other cat breeds are pretty have pretty good diversity. We need to continually monitor this. this. This data now is over 20 years old. So has that continued in our cat breeds? Genetics will help. We know that some breeds are related, more related to others. So each one of these colors means a different breed. And we can see that Persians are very closely related to British short hairs. That means any mutations and diseases found in Persians, we should watch them for British, be watching in British short hairs too. So British short hairs also have PKD just like Persians do as well. We know there are different uh, populations of cats around the world, whether you want to call them races or just different genetic populations. This information can be used. So if you want to be outbreeding your cats, bringing in more genetic variation, you can do that. You can go to the country of origin and add that into your cat breed. Um, we now hope that with the high density DNA array, we will be able to look at things like PKD. Well, we already know the main mutation, what's the big deal? Most cats have very mild PKD, live a normal life, make it 14, 15 years and, and yeah, they might die of renal failure, but it wasn't because of PKD. But some cats get very, very severe disease. Some cats get horrible disease that also affects their liver. 
what's going on there. What's the genetic modifiers that are affecting polycystic kidney disease? So as I mentioned with blue, all the genes of our body interact in some way. So even though we found the main mutation, there's still going to be other genes and mutations that affect things. We hope to start looking at more, slightly more complex things, such as feline oral facial pain, FOP. So working very closely with Claire Rusbridge on uh, this project, and we hope to study that on the DNA array. As I mentioned, dominant white, can we start figuring out why some cats are deaf and others are not? It might just be a completely random process and we'll find nothing. So just why I said, why does genome sequencing fail? Because it's not genetic in the first place. Maybe deafness is just random process and it's just luck of the draw. We will find out. We'd be able to try to find out what are the little modifiers of these different blue variants. And uh, even though we have the main mutation, what makes these different shades of gray? So I do want to point out that historically we've had NIH funding and that's uh, become much more difficult. So my lab has to uh, interact a lot more. We always continue to try to get NIH funding. Wind Feline Foundation has always been our champion. They've always been here for us. Royal Canin still feels, um, um, supports my cat colony with free food. We're working with Hills Pet Nutrition to actually develop the high density array but um, always looking for funding from Morris Animal Foundation. They're also a good place to uh, find cat funding as well. And we try every different aspect that we can, but always remember the Wind Feline Foundation help us with this match today and, and get us this $1,500 at least. Let's get it up to 3,000 or more. And then always remember you can uh, donate directly to the lab. So. Thank you. That's the end of our presentation today, and um, I'll stay online. I see it's uh, about, uh, we've been on for about an hour and 26 minutes now, and uh, be glad to take any questions. Remember, cats rule and dogs drool. I could not agree more, Leslie. My dog <laughs> drools everywhere. Thank you for that great and thorough presentation. It was super. Okay, I hope uh, I hope you uh, learned a few new things today. I always try to put a few new things in the presentations, and um, and always willing to do things for uh, these educational seminars for Win Feline. And I know some breeders would rather hear about just one topic. Uh, so today was just kind of an introduction. And if you ask Win Feline, I will be happy to do just coat color specific talks or disease talks or population talks. It's just now there's too much information and we can't put it all in one presentation anymore. Absolutely. Well, it was super, 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 super. Now I think I'm screen sharing. Can you guys all see my screen? Are we still looking at Leslie's? I can see yours. All right, super. Well, let's get going then. Uh, this is, I wanted to, uh, I don't see mine. There we go. Follow up, Leslie had it right. We need to text CAT, C-A-T-S, to 833-985-2287 to donate to Win Feline Foundation. We have $500. That means we only got to get 1,000. Come on, let's take all of this money that's been offered to Win Feline Foundation. They've offered $1,500 in matching grants so we can raise 3,000 today. So please text CATS to 833-985-2287. Now, before I go any further, I forgot to include at the very first slide, thanks to Dr. Elsie's, Dr. Elsie's precious cat, Dr. Elsie's clean protein. It's some terrific food created at the whole company. It was created by cat only veterinarian right there in Colorado. They make terrific litter because the number one complaint of many of his clients were that the cats went outside the litter box. They make a variety of different litters to suit any cat's needs. So find the best litter for your cat at drlcs.com. They just started, well, a couple of years ago with some terrific food, clean protein, both dry and can. Check it out. I'm looking for questions for Dr. Lyons, but she mentioned earlier, and I wanted to just uh, display um, some of the work that she's done that's affected what folks like myself who love all cats, but and, steeped in breeds and uh, breed registries are really helping to understand and to make better decisions about 
to use applications for the 63 DNA, uh, 63K DNA array, how she is working on a new one. How big is the new one, Leslie? Six, it'll be 6,500 uh, markers for a commercial uh, array, but we're, we're, we get to do what's called a screening array. And a screening array will have about 2 million different markers on it. So we're going to try to uh, put some hot projects across that, that's a very limited commodity. So uh, my collaborators and I will be trying to look at that 2 million screening array. And we're going to put like uh, the perms and uh, Tennessee Rex on there. We've sequenced those cats, but we can't find the mutation. So if this array can say, hey, look at this chromosome, look here, then we probably should be able to make some headway. But uh, we hope to make a commercial product that will be 10 times better than uh, the 63K array and also designed so that it'll help all cats around the world. So we're making sure that we have cats from China and Russia uh, to help us select the final set of what we call SNPs that would go on the commercial product, the 650K array. Uh, so that's a single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? That's right, you got it. All right. All right. And because, you know, what we learned, certainly what I've learned about cats, help helps me to see the whole world and sometimes you want to know, you know what are you reading where are you continuing to stay engaged i'd really recommend adam rutherford fantastic author he's got a great book called a brief history of everyone who's ever lived which goes through kind of all the chromosomes that we know in people um genetics unzipped is a super podcast from the uh, genetic society um, i love this biologist this incredible researcher sarah tishkoff at university of pennsylvania uh, tiny expeditions from hudson alpha institute is a terrific podcast it's really approachable and you know dogs might drool but those folks support their researchers with a ton of money and they do some really great um practical applications of the information they find out. Check out the Canine Health Institute, um, CHIC, which is part of the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, just to stay relevant. You know, cat genetics, speaking of which, we got to thank Tika, the International Cat Association, talking about relevant cat genetics. Tika is one of the sponsors, along with Dr. Elsie's of this. Uh, you know, cats are unique. Leslie talked about what makes a cat a cat uh, compared to some of the other carnivores out there. And I did this slide a few weeks ago, but I think it's still relative because it highlights that continuum of uh, research that is done and how it crosses biologists and naturalists and geneticists like Leslie. But you see the domestic cat is there because we play a role too, helping to better understand. Um, cats have been part of the human condition for as far as we can remember from, I like this uh, piece of the Egyptian, um, a, a part of a pyramid, the inside, because you see cats used both as clothing. Um, it looks like one cat is dead and may have maybe eaten or maybe uh, worn. You see a lion on a leash and a cheetah on a leash. So cats have served multiple uh, different roles in our lives. In the Mesoamerican, that's actually a, a water cup with likely an ocelot. Uh, some Greek, uh, a Greek frieze with a cat. And some Native Americans from the uh, mid 1800s, you can see the little kid is holding a very cute pet kitten. This Egyptian uh, cat with its kittens. The, this is a Chinese merchant selling kittens and a free uh, image illustrated by one of the first uh, European explorers to go back. The choices that we make is for domestic cats as part of our household members as a pet, but also as a helpful working companion to us. I mean, it does affect their health, their immunity, their appearance, temperament behavior, their longevity, as Leslie mentioned, uh, because cats have been part of lots of different lives. Like there is a photo of that 1871 cat show at the Crystal Palace, Leslie mentioned, that um, Charles Darwin attended. And I love that uh, painting just above. It's called The Pastoral Visit. This is uh, from 1871, just after the Civil War, uh, Black pastors visiting a family in rural Virginia. And I love it because you see at the bottom by the gentleman's foot, there is a cat drinking from a bowl of milk. Cats are just an integral part of our life and our civilization and the work that Leslie has done, thanks to an Abyssinian named Cinnamon up there, um, to help better define what we know about uh, a genome, how it affects what we see, 
and how it affects how we interact with cats from just a cheek swab, isolating the DNA, sequencing it, sequencing it using utilizing the Illumina, uh, this incredible piece of machinery below there. And this whole presentation, thanks to Tika and Dr. Elsie's, will remain on the Wind Feline Foundation website. So you can go back and look at it again and again, because some of that stuff Leslie was talking about was so specific and so cool, but it took a couple more brain cells than I had available to me this morning. So we can go back and watch it again and again. So we get it all and we can look as excited as these cats do right at the top of this slide. Um, because we are in involved in the ongoing understanding and uh, application of this genetic information. I've included here just some ways that cat breeders and cat lovers, you don't have to be a breeder to be involved in all of this. Screening your cat at the UC Davis Veterinary Genetics Lab, getting the results and sharing it. Now, Dr. Lyons is going to be willing to answer some questions. Um, yeah, here I got the, the question box working now. So go um, for it, Doc. What do you got? I, I can do that. So we have some uh, uh, initial questions about uh, Angoras. So what we do know about long hair is probably the mutation probably did arise in the Near East, perhaps in Iran, um, because we know what the, the background uh, haplotype that mutation has occurred on, and that haplotype is common in the Near East. So originally Persians were called Angoras. So if you want to kind of differentiate between a Persian and an Angora now, well, that's way now passed along in history, right? So the M4 mutation, which uh, really is the most prevalent mutation and common in Angoras and Persians, that probably is the original mutation, the oldest mutation, and that did occur in the Near East. So if you want to say, is the Angora the original long-haired cat or the Persian? Well, I'm under the impression that the Persians were used to be Angoras or the Angora cat, but then we split them after that. So I think that's a little bit of splitting whiskers there as to um, which, which breed originated long hair. But we do know that the, the mutation came from the Near East. Um, let's see, another question, hermaphrodites. Uh, yes, yeah, so hermaphrodites are caused by sex chromosomal abnormalities. So that's what a sterile calico male is. He's basically her a hermaphrodite. They, you generally have improperly formed genitalia as well. And that be can be caused by having different chromosomes, XXY, when you should only have XY or XX, or it can be a disruption. We're now starting to find genes, specific genes, such as the gene SRY can be disrupted and that can cause a hermaphrodite as well. So it can be a specific gene or it can be a chromosomal abnormality. Um, blue eyes are more common in white cats than in solid cats. Yes, because the blue eyes are due to um, not having as, as many melanocytes in your in your iris. And so full colored cats have more melanocytes than a dominant white cat or cats that have bicolor as well. But what about Siamese? Why are they blue eyed? Well, they're blue eyed because they have melanocytes, but the enzyme making melanin is disrupted. And so they have less melanin production within the cells in the iris. So the melanocytes are there, but you're not making as much pigment. So that's a different reason of why they have blue eyes. And so that would be like what we would call a phenocopy or disease heterogeneity. We couldn't study blue eyes by mixing Siamese with dominant white cats. Well, we love um, you, Melanin, and I wanna let anybody know because we just passed our 2.30 mark that Dr. Lyons is gonna continue asking questions. We're gonna keep recording, so if you gotta go, but you wanna come back to hear these fantastic questions and answers, you can do that. And thank you, Doc, we just raised another $785. There Good you go. Good job. All right. All right. Let's keep going. All right. So uh, next question, how long does it take to do whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing? Well, actually it can be done quick, very quickly provided the right scenario happens. So if I was send DNA over to the sequencing core, so first I need to get the DNA, I need to prepare the DNA, which can take just a couple days. 
and then I can take it over to the core. If we can get it into their queue right away, they then have to make a DNA library and then they test that DNA library to make sure it's good. And then they put it on the sequencing machine. That could all happen within just a couple weeks and we have the data. Well, then we have to analyze the data. Well, we've set up a pipeline via funding of the Win Feline Foundation to do that in a rather rapid process. So we can process the genome sequencing of a cat very quickly as well. So really, in humans, they hope to do this all under two weeks. Um, some places can do it within 50 hours or 26 hours, but we're really not set up to do that type of stuff in veterinary practices. But we can do it rather quickly. But often what we're waiting for is to have a bolus of samples where uh, the most efficient thing to do is to sequence about 30 cats all at once. And then you've got to make sure you're in line for the bioimmunit. So technically it can be done very quickly. And that's what we're hoping to do because we want to do precision medicine and help disease diagnosis and help the veterinarian. Um, but in the end, it still takes a, us a bit of a while to do that. And it all depends where in that process. So it could take anywhere from a month to up to six months to be able to get the data back. All right. So, um, has research identified a genetic link for flat-chested kittens or pectus activatum? Uh, no, not that I know of, but I know that is the interest of Brian Davis as Texas A&M. He's both always been interested in Bengal cats and other breeds of cats that have flat-chested kittens. And so he would be the person to contact to keep sending um, information to those guys. And you can send your request for that stuff to me and I've got Brian Davis's contact. There you go. I'm a munchkin breeder since 1994. I'm glad to hear about the munchkins. Um, it's not a question, it's just, well, so uh, what we have, we do know the gene mutation for munchkins. Uh, that paper has just been accepted. It was part of the paper that actually describes what we call the version nine cat genome reference assembly. So that ended up being in a very important paper. And uh, we've also collected uh, structural information on those cats. So we haven't seen signs of uh, disc problems in the dwarf cats. It's actually a different gene in dogs. And um, so we don't see that, but we have to be uh, very diligent with how we breed munchkin cats. So we don't want them shorter. We actually want them longer. So um, something we have to be very careful about. And I'll just add, Doc, that, you know, it's munchkins are part of the rest of the breeds of cat that should be bred carefully. We can utilize all the tools, all the findings of your research and the sciences that scientists, scientists that are collaborating so that it's not just munchkins, that we look at their structure and their function when we decide who to breed to who. It's not just how pretty the cat is, but you know, does it poop in the corner or does it use a litter box? Does it scream all day and all night? You know, can it walk from A to B? And does it like sitting in my lap? All of those are considerations. But first of all, it's got to be able to walk to me. So if there's a, a functional aspect of that cat that prevents it from moving well, from jumping to come visit me and assist me in brushing my teeth, all of that is in consideration. And I don't know a serious cat breeder who doesn't. Very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So what about HCM? Well, there's, there's a host of people working on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, there is a bit of a consortium working group out there. So people I know about, of course, Dr. Kate Mears is working on HCM in various different breeds. Uh, Dr. Longeri in Milan, and Jangstrom in Sweden, uh, still Josh Stern and Mark Kittleson at UC Davis. Virginia Luis Fuentes, if I've forgotten a, a, a new group out of um, out of Belgium, out of Ghent, University of Ghent is looking at HCM. So I think actually what has happened is Dr. Mears has found the two very common mutations that explains a lot. And then after that, it might become very individual specific like it is in humans, there's uh, hundreds of different genes that cause HCM, 
and hundreds of different mutations. So we might be finding that now different lineages of cats might have their own private mutations. So to my knowledge, there hasn't been any major breakthrough. Uh, mutation in MYH7 has been published by the University of Ghent, but that was in a random bred cat and it might be specific to that cat. So unfortunately, we might be seeing that as the more common thing, which actually is the more common thing in genetics is people have private mutations that are private to themselves and then to their families. So unfortunately, I think we're gonna see that for HCM as well. Um, always collecting uh, samples for smoke and silver cats. So those are always welcome. If you send a silver cat, send the most related cat that is not silver. Case and control, that's, uh, that's what helps us the most. Hey doc, I have a question about your silver. So yeah. uh, people will re every time I go anywhere and talk about cat genetics, the first or the third or the fifth question is about silver. And I know that silver is part of a continuum of things that you're researching, but that research can't happen unless it's fully supported. And you know, because you can't just look for one little needle in the haystack, as you mentioned about this whole array that you're building. Silver could be part of that, and it may be part of that, but you need the funding to do it, right? Absolutely, you know, so people have always asked me about silver. Silver has never been a funded project, you know, and why is because we thought, oh, this one's gonna be easy, and here it is, and there we go, and then it turns out to be one of these Tennessee Rex and Laperm things. <laughs> why, why can't you just not find that? And you yourself has found out that glitter, Glitter was no easy character, and, <laughs> and, and it took a lot of high-tech genomics to find <laughs> glitter. It's a structural variant. Orange is a structural variant. It's not in any coding part of the gene. So that's why these other ones have been so tricky to find. We know silver is not in a coding part of a gene. Um, so then it becomes harder to try to prove what it does. But um, we have uh, received funding from a specific group of about $5,000 to try to work on silver. Something I need to point out, how much does it cost me to do research? Good, good any, question. Any technician, whether it's a postdoc, uh, a student, or a tech with a master's degree, in the end, they're gonna cost about $50,000 plus 30% over that for their benefits. So in the end, an individual costs about $1,500 a week. That's what salaries are. That's what tuitions are. So you say, oh, don't, you know, don't use a tech, use a student. Well, a student's going to take you three, four, five times longer, <laughs> right? But you still got to pay them about, you got to pay their tuition, you got to pay their stipends, you got to pay all this other stuff as well. So, um, you know, it's not cheap and the big cost now, sequencing's cheap, $1,000, that's less than an MRI. Mm -hmm. um, but people are, are always the biggest costs. And uh, so keep that in mind that that's how much it costs just to, to keep one tech in the lab for a week is about $1,500. And we can help defray some of that cost by supporting your research so that you not only can you look for those things that we're interested in, but you can support the people that it takes to help you do that, right? Right, right. So uh, I have a question, you know, we were harping kind of on brachycephalic breeds. Uh, what about the cats with the long faces? Well, I haven't heard as much problems with the long faces, but we always have to be very careful with um, the, the jaws properly lining up. You know, I've definitely seen um, cats with undershot jaws and overshot jaws and stuff. So with, when you're dealing with the conformational changes, you have to be very careful with all the other things that go along with that. So you wanna make sure that the teeth are lining up properly so that the cat can eat well. Um, you, you might not, you might get some dogs have a long nose and everything, but it's a pinched down type of nose. So they still have tearing problems. Um, so you have to watch for that as well. Just because the cat's face is long, you still have maybe altered the tear ducts uh, with those cats as well. So um, you always just have to be very careful when you go to the extreme. And that's what we need people to back off from is the extreme a little bit. 
Yeah, we've had uh, a great demonstration of you know, both the success of selection for the extreme and the challenges that come from it with dogs, finding out that the anatomy and even the bone structure of the things that we love is a lot more plastic than we thought they were and can be stretched in any direction. Right. Um, Doc, you got another question? Uh, yeah, we have, a, is there an association between black fur and the immune system? Not that I know of in cats. Uh, we do know there's um, <laughs> an association in dogs with uh, blue dilution and also with black and, and they have um, a lot of problems with their hair coats as well. So that, even though it's the same mutation in dogs and melanophyllin as it is in cats or the same gene, cats do not have uh, that type of uh, hair problem that you find in dogs. And wasn't um, your former uh, colleague at the NIH, Eduardo Isaac, who um, figured out that uh, Jaguars have a dominant black compared to the recessive black in uh, domestic cats? That's right. Uh, why cats are black are different reasons as well. In, in domestic cats, it's only the agouti mutation, but in some of the wild felids, it's actually a dominant mutation in melanocortin receptor. And uh, yeah, Dr. Edward Ezarik has shown that. Uh, but we don't have an MC1R mutation that causes dominant black in cats. That is known in other species, dogs and horses, I think as well. Great. All right. We have another question about uh, progressive retinal atrophy and, and testing. So um, there are now four different genes known for progressive retinal atrophy. Two are in Abyssinians, one in Persian, and one in Bengal cats. And uh, the one in Abyssinians, the CEP290 mutation, is probably the one that's being asked about the most because we see that that mutation is found at a slightly higher frequency in other um, Asian type breeds such as Orientals and, and uh, those cats. But the condition seems to be much more mild in those cats or maybe a much later onset. So you have to be careful about the onset. It could have variable expression, and so you could have a later onset, or uh, maybe it doesn't have an onset at all. So again, maybe there's something in those breeds that counteracts this mutation. And that's true all the time. We do find individuals, and this is called incomplete penetrance, that should have a mutation and don't get sick. And that's because our body is very good at being survivors. And so we have many other systems in our body that will take over and take control and help alleviate a, a, a malformity uh, within our um, biological processes. So um, that can always be careful. You always have to be careful. The thing is, do you say, oh, well, I have the mutation, but the cat is mild, I'm not gonna bother, or the cat never got, you don't know what's gonna happen with the next cat produced with that mutation. So you should still be trying to eliminate that mutation, whether it caused your particular cat to have vision problems or not, because you don't know what's gonna happen down the road. And I think a lot of people get a false sense of security um, by thinking, well, my cat didn't get, go blind, so I don't have to worry about it. I think I've answered HCM. Anthony, can you put the slide with the that I sent you up, the one with the, or do you want me to put it up? With yeah, our sponsors. Feel free to put it up, Virginia. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, no. That's okay. Let me, I gotta, gotta if grab it here. If you're looking to submit uh, information to the lab uh, or swabs, just uh, my website, feline genetics at missouri.edu, that has all the information of how to submit samples, whether it's swabs or DNA samples or uh, anything like that. Why is it difficult to get an HCM test for Bermans? Well, we kind of already <laughs> talked about that yet. So uh, there might be more than one mutation in your Berman cats is might be the problems. What diseases are pointed cats prone to? Well, it depends what you're saying pointed. Pointed could be a pointed Persian cat, which is a Himalayan. And so it's, it's all the different um, 
things that are found in Persians, such as polycystic kidney disease or PRA. If the pointed cat is an oriental type cat, then you're working about the other PRA, the CEP290, you might be worried about pyruvate kinase deficiency, some of the gangliosidoses. So pointed itself is not really causing major problems. We do know there's association of strabismus and stagmus with pointed, um, but that should be, that's, that would be common in any breed that's actually pointed. I think I mentioned in the in my um, uh, presentation that studying the tints of lilacs and chocolates, no, there's no research, but now maybe we could study those type of things. But what we always have to be careful about is that we genetically type all the mutations that we know. We have to do that before we put cats in categories, like if we were talking about the loop modifier, um, we have to make sure are they, you know, um, tested for all the different extension mutations, all the brown mutations, and everything that we already know. And people that want to contribute often don't want to do that. And so I'm sorry, we do have to have you do that. So you have to take that extra step to participate in studies like that. I know a lot of people send the samples to us and say, well, you do it. And it's like, no, we're not free genetic testers. We need you to do <laughs> that, that information Darn. first. Yeah. And uh, then we would try to set up that type of study. Well, there's so many questions. I'm just seeing them. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I touched upon some. Um, some are getting repeated as they as they go down, so we're not losing them, I think. And um, will these slides be available to download? I can answer that yeah. one, uh, Ms. Ebersol. You can't download the slides, but you can watch the video again. I've been to a lot of presentations that you didn't get a chance to see of Dr. Lyons presenting to her colleagues in the feline genetics field, and those are serious scientific. Uh, uh, conferences. You can't take photos. I didn't have many photos because she'll look right at you and say, uh-uh, no taking pictures of my slides. But this one, she was very specific so that you can come to Wind Feline Foundation, watch this over again. You don't screenshot because this is special information just for you guys. <laughs> but you can donate to Wind Feline Foundation so that Dr. Lyons is available to do this again. And she can pay all those fantastic new techs who might find all these genes that I see questions about. Right. You have to realize it it took me an entire day uh, to put this talk together. And um, it took and an entire it's lifetime it, to it, find it, yeah, it's, a, it's a lifetime of my work and information. And uh, and then also, you know, we I reused a lot of slides that I often use, but it still takes you a whole day to put together a brand new talk. If you're, if you're trying to do it well and stuff. Uh, a question here about exotics and Persians. Uh, they're one in the same. Uh, uh, that was the first question I was ever asked by the CFA. Is an exotic just a short-haired Persian? And, you know, should they be different breeds? You guys get to name what breeds are breeds. Uh, that it does not, I have no dog in that fight, right? Mm -hmm. But genetically, when I'm doing studies, I do need to know who is closely related to who? Can I put exotics and Persians in the same study to po study polycystic kidney disease? And the answer is yes, because they're genetically the same. The only difference is the long hair mutation. Now, as time goes by and you keep those things separated, maybe eventually you might make them into genetically distinct groups or populations, but um, when we did our work, they certainly were not genetically distinct. Uh, I think uh, Simona uh, da, Dalgel, let's pronounce it, joins a lot of other folks who want to say thank you for taking the time to do this, and uh, the board of the Wind Feline Foundation that I'm very proud to be on uh, for sponsoring this webinar. Doc, are you still doing research with Norwegian forest cats? Yeah, we're uh, working with uh, Virginia Louise Fuentes uh, from the point of view of studying um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, um, so I don't personally do uh, the work, but she is my collaborator. And so uh, we're working on Norwegian forest cats from that regard. We're at, I personally am interested in Siberians with HCM. 
So mm -hmm. if you have a Siberian with HCM, we'd certainly love to have a sample from you. Uh, so that's something we'll probably try on these DNA arrays as well. So um, a lot of the times I'm not specifically doing the collection of samples because for HCM studies, you really should be using a very good cardiologist. But, uh, but on, in the end, they might send the samples to me to do the genetic part of, of the studies, or at least maybe produce the genome sequence, and then I give the data back to them and their students uh, do the research. Uh, so we try to help facilitate any groups that we can. And is MC1R, melanocortin receptor, is that the same as an extension locus? Ask yes, Daryl Newkirk. Hi, Daryl. Yes, that. <laughs> That is the E locus. Yes, that's extension melanocortin receptor one. Yes, MC1R. And um, so I, this is another thing I forgot to mention with for people that want to continue to, to engage with the cool world of cat genetics. When they see an odd cat that looks a little different, like Linda Galloway has a cat that looks cinnamon, but on all the genetic tests, it doesn't test as cinnamon. I've got an idea, Doc, but you wonder what could this soft chocolatey non-cinnamon color be and what should she do? Well, um, uh, probably the easiest thing, you know, so the first thing I'm going to say, well, gee, it could be a new extension mutation. It could be a new brown mutation, right? It could be a new agouti mutation. So we have a few of those. So you either start sequencing each one of those genes or you say, the heck with that. I'm just all going to whole genome sequence my cat. And then I'll be able to answer all those all in one fair, fair swoop. So at this point in time, it's actually better to just whole genome sequence your cat. And so what you could do, get three mils of blood and need about $1,000 to cover that. And we'll get the cat genome sequenced and we'll, we'll look for new mutations in those cats. That Here's like an a interesting fun. question. When and where did blotch tabby, classic tabby mutation Ooh. occur? All right. So um, this question was actually answered years ago by a person by Neil Todd, who did um, population studies on cats and actually looked at the frequency of the blotched mutation around the world. And it seems like the blotch mutation is more common in Europe and maybe the UK. So people have thought that the blotch mutation has occurred there. But from some of the clippings that uh, John Smithson was sending me, it also seems like it could have maybe uh, developed in Sweden as well. So um, that's one of the cool things that we could maybe do with uh, when we get more genome sequencing and more DNA array data is to maybe do what we did with the long hair mutation to actually try to find where we think that mutation occurred and when we think it occurred as well. But right now, all we have on that is um, really Neil Todd's data that is the most supportive of where it happened. And there was a, a question earlier about the uh, marble Bengals or cheated marbled uh, cats. And I think, um, you know, People see patterns really uh, vividly on cats. They, I don't know how many shelters I've been in where they every striped cat is called a tiger cat. And there's yep. a lot of research going on in that. Uh, yeah, definitely. So I hope that you get Chris Kalin or Greg Barsh to come on and do one of these educational seminars. Chris and Greg are the kings of pattern and um, they're really involved with tabby patterns and markings. And uh, it's really fascinating work because it's really cell-cell interactions and why are these co colors important in cats? Well, it really tells us how our cells are talking to one another and how uh, cells migrate during development and stuff. So it's very basic biology that's very cool. So um, what just might be stripes on a cat is actually very important to biology and human development. And it all builds on that research that Leslie has been spending her lifetime working on. It's uh, not me, done me in a vacuum. Me and others too. Yeah, me yeah and absolutely. Others lots too. of folks. Yeah, there's lots of folks out there. What is your opinion about <laughs> blue-eyed Maine Coons that don't have white? Could this be a mutation? Could this be created by adding the Altia gene, which I don't know what that is, from different breeds? So um, love to see some of these cats. So um, 
if it's a full colored cat and it has blue eyes, yeah, there's something else going on. There's some type of new genetic mutation that's probably going on. And it'd be very interesting to try to figure out what's uh, going on with these cats. Actually, that's kind of a little side interest of mine is forensics. And in humans, in human forensics, they have a panel of mutations for looking at eye color and skin color and um, one other thing that I can't remember what it is, hair color. And, and so you can actually find DNA of a suspect and predict what their skin tone might be, what their eye color might be, and what their hair color would be. Well, in cats, it's like, it's the perfect proof. You pick up one cat hair, it might be white. And if there's enough DNA on there, you could say, no, this is classic tabby and this little white hair was just from its undercoat or from some white spot like that. So cats are a perfect example of, um, of using genetics to figure out what, uh, colors and what something would actually look like. So I would love to get more cats uh, that have full color and these blue eyes. I've heard about it. People mm -hmm. have promised it, but in the end, the samples never kind of uh, really show up. What's going on with amyloidosis research? Well, um, we think we have a few mutations that cause risk for um, Abyssinians, but there's multiple mutations, over about six of them. So we want to be very careful before we publish something like this that, hey, here's six mutations. Because now what are you going to do with that? You have to type all six mutations. And if you have this particular combination, what is your risk? And that's what we don't know. Out of the six mutations, we know a couple have very high risk, but we don't know the intermediates. What if you have five out of six or four out of six? What does that mean? So. We still want to look at more Abyssinians and the Siamese uh, potentially on the high density array. So we're getting set up to do that so that we could maybe make some more headway with amyloidosis. So um, I was pleased that we found risk factors in the first place. So I was pleased with that, but we've realized how cautious we have to be before letting that information out. How common is HTN in a Persian? Um, do you know what HTN is, Anthony? I, um, I don't know. Height, thoracic, colors. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. oh. So uh, hypertension. H I think they mean HCN. Maybe HCM and they spelled it wrong. No, HTN. It's a hypertension. Yeah. Uh, that I don't know uh, because uh, first off, I think it's actually very hard to get blood pressure on cats. Um, without giving them high blood pressure. Without giving them high blood pressure. So I don't know anything about hypertension in Persian cats. In polycystic kidney disease cats, in humans with PKD, they commonly have hypertension, but that is uh, more nebulous in the cat. We haven't really quite shown that cats with, for example, PKD have um, clearly have hypertension. I saw, uh, I think it's Carissa Ebersol asked, can you put Orientals and Siamese in the same uh, uh, population study? Um, and I think you answered this when you talked about Persians and exotics. Yeah. You know, how, it kind of how... depends on the lineages. Exactly. Um, yeah, so you have to be careful, a little more careful with Oriental and Siamese. And that's because of the Siamese part of it. Siamese have been so closely, you know, they keep their lines really, really clear. And, you know, um, so they're, they're the ones that said, oh, we want 12 generations of a pedigree to be a Siamese cat. So it kind of makes the Siamese more differentiated than say an Oriental with other breeds. But if I was going to choose something, I would put Orientals and color points and, and probably the next closest breed would be Siamese. Peter Balds fall into that category as well. Um, so the Asian cats do kind of cluster nicely together. Is amber a real color in the Norwegian forest cat? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a new, real mutation and so is russet. And so what would be cool is let's start combining all these MCA1R <laughs> mutations. What does a cat that has russet and amber, what does that look like? Um, so those are things we kind of don't know because those crosses haven't been done. But yes, amber is a real mutation and, and really, really uh, 
is uh, true. And you can see Amber Katz at the International Cat Association, Tika, because they are a sponsor of this session. And I was just told I need to thank them again. Thank you, Tika. Thank you, Dr. Elsie, for sponsoring our webinar today. Go ahead, yep. Doc. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, what do you define risk factors as mentioning regarding amyloidosis? What I mean is that each one of the six mutations that we found adds risk to a cat developing um, amyloidosis. So the thing is, we don't know, what we don't know and why we haven't published yet is if, if the cat has all six mutations, yeah, it has the highest risk, but we can't quite put a number to that yet. Is that an 80% risk? Is that a 70% risk? What if it only has four or five of them? And, and we can't put numbers to that quite yet. And that's because we really don't have good population data in the normal population. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to collect on, on those type of cats. So you have to realize the ACM mutation in Maine Coons is a risk factor because not every Maine Coon that gets that mutation gets heart disease. And that's really our first example of a risk factor. Um, so, but we know if you have two copies of that mutation, you have a much higher risk than if you have one copy versus you have no copies. But what we like to do is actually put numbers to that if we can. Wow, I'm reading, what do you think is a healthy limit of total inbreeding coefficient in cats? That's interesting. I don't even use inbreeding coefficient because your two cats don't inherit the same amount of genes from both parents. Yeah, that's that's what we want to be careful uh, about. Very good point there. Um, people often use pedigrees to calculate inbreeding coefficients. That's perfectly legit, but what you have to realize is that is an average. And um, so if you produce, let's let's talk about the Bengal cats. If you produce an F1, that cat is absolutely 50% leopard cat, 50% domestic cat. If you've used a domestic cat as, as the breeding uh, mate, right? But with the next generation, if you breed your F1 back to a full-blooded domestic cat, it ought to be 25% Asian leopard cat. Well, it all depends on what you inherited. You could inherit all 50% from the Asian leopard cat, or you could inherit zero. <laughs> so, so now you only have, but the average is 25%. And uh, so that's what you have to be careful about with inbreeding coefficients. Those inbreeding coefficients are averages. And so what is acceptable? Um, what is acceptable is when you have a healthy lineage of cats. So no one has ever put drawn a line of 0 0.25. 0 0.25 is acceptable and, and that's good. That's not how you should be thinking about it. When I showed that chart of increasing inbreeding coefficient, it actually it was increasing heterozygosity. And wait, 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 say that word again. Say that word again. Heterozygosity. Heterozygosity means how much how much are you heterozygous? How much uh, each a gene, do you have two different alleles at each gene? So that's what I equate to diversity. How diverse are you? So um, that one picture I showed was diversity, um, but the black bars were inbreeding coefficients. So what you wanna do is maximize diversity and keep inbreeding coefficient as low as possible. One of my favorite cats, that's a whole nother story, is the Korots. <laughs> because Korots a breed, what, there's 10, 20 yeah. born every year, yeah. you know? But they use cats from Thailand. They share their cats all over the world. They have high heterozygosity and low inbreeding. So they are the proof that if you properly manage your cat population, you can have a very healthy breed. Now, they have diseases, gangliosidosis. They have two of them. And they've been able to manage those, but keep good heterozygosity and low inbreeding. So it can be done, but you have to be a very cooper cooperative group. Well, um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked, how can they send more money? Please, you can text 
cat c a t s to eight six six nine eight five two two eight seven. Help us get all fifteen hundred of this matching donation. Uh, you want to watch this archived webinar? Please do. And every time you watch it, text c a t s to eight six six nine eight five two two eight seven and give money or donate directly to Dr. Lyons Research at uh, Missouri um, University of Missouri. Uh, it's eight three three nine eight five two two eight seven. Um, Doc, how, how do you measure heterozygosity? <laughs> this, this makes me feel like I'm on a telethon, you know, so uh, <laughs> you are, uh, I grew up in money. Pittsburgh, so 6215-808 <laughs> is the number for public broadcasting in, in Pittsburgh, so donate to Mr. Rogers, <laughs> um, and I will never forget that number ever in my life, you know, so. Um, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. If you a get beautiful day money. in the neighborhood in Pittsburgh, I, I certainly hope so. So um, how do you measure heterozygosity? Uh, you have to genetically type a bunch of genetic markers that are not under any type of selection. So what we call anonymous markers, and that's, well, we used to talk about STRs, short tandem repeat markers or microsatellites. Mm -hmm. They were just markers from all over the genome that were not associated with anything, not associated with health or any phenotypes, and you genetically type them and you actually see, you know, your cat is, how much are they vary? How many loci are they homozygote for? How many loci are they heterozygote for? And you get a number. Well, that number in itself means nothing unless you know what the rest of the population of your cats look like. So you got to know what the rest of the breed looks like in order to say, well, my cat's good or bad. Yeah. But then you really need to look at random bred cats to say, well, how does my breed look compared to random bred cats. And that's actually what that graph I showed actually compares because at the one end of the scale is random bred cats. Can you have high inbreeding and be healthy? Absolutely, absolutely. So, but high inbreeding kind of stacks the cards against you. One of the questions is, is uh, inbreeding associated with the immune system? Well, if you've made your immune system not diverse. What that means is when a new virus comes along, like COVID-19, and you don't have a diverse, healthy immune system, maybe you can't fight it off. And if you have a whole population that is just like you, and you get COVID-19, it might wipe out your whole population. So this COVID-19 stuff is the perfect example that new viruses are always gonna show up in our life, whether it's ones that affect humans or ones that affect cats. So we do want a healthy immune system. You stack the deck in your favor with more genetic diversity tends to mean a more diverse immune system, which means your immune system can fight off more different things. And I've had this conversation about cheetahs uh, because of the um, published information about how closely related they are. And I always tell my fellow cat breeders, you know, cheetahs had mother nature working on their behalf so that all the cheetahs, their main um, goal was to survive. So all the ones that even with their high degree of inbreeding, you know, couldn't run quite as fast from the lion, they all died. So we have the most healthy group of this low genetically diverse, this uh, not very heterozygotic group of uh, animals left. But we right. don't want to be cheetahs. Right. We don't want to, but, but cheetahs are a good example also. Like uh, there has been cheetahs that have been in different um, reserves mm -hmm. that uh, got exposed with feline infectious peritonitis. Well, guess what? It killed a third of them. Yep. Killed a third of them because they didn't have the immune system. The guys that survived had slightly different genetics and they probably were able to fight off FIP. So, and that's what we worry about too, is viruses jumping species. So we've seen canine distemper get into the lion populations as well. So um, this is always a battle. Um, and so the more diverse the cats are, uh, one cat might die because it didn't have the right combination of things. What you wanna prevent is the whole population being the same because then the population can still survive it different individuals have different things. So you always want to try to maximize diversity, but it's hard to say, you know, um, 
just because you're diverse, you could still have the wrong combination of something and be susceptible. Adam Rutherford has a good uh, collection about this subject in his book, uh, Brief History of Everyone Who's Ever Lived, talking about uh, African slaves in North America. And he said, well, how come they didn't use you know, Native Americans? And uh, he couples this with other information showing multiple uh, multiple times over history, people have left Africa, and Africa has the largest genetic diversity uh, of people on the planet, so that they didn't, they were exposed to diseases that the rest of the population got, but because they had enough genetic diversity, they didn't die at the same rate as Native Americans did, so that they made for a much better population to have to endure what uh, they att uh, was attempted to get Native Americans to endure, and genetic diversity is the reason they were able to persist which is pretty impressive. Okay, a few other questions here. Why are the blue eyes, this is interesting, um, uh, why are the blue eyes much brighter in Vans and Angoras and Anatolis Ooh. than, um, I don't know what a Saint Burmese is. Um, so a I'm really good one. Sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a, holy, a holy Burmese. But, um, so I don't know the answer to that. So I've seen, Boy, I've seen some Siamese that have some really deep, rich blue eyes. And I think that is slow selection by good breeders that have selected for probably the modifiers of eye color to get those deep blue eyes. So I would think maybe there's just a population difference between the modifiers of um, eye color that allows some cats to have more brilliant blue eyes. Um, but but also we have to remember that Burmese have different uh, eye color because of a different reason. Uh, so Angoras and Vans and Anatolis, that's because of the kit mutation, where Burmese is because of the TYR mutation. So different reasons of why they have blue eyes. Uh, long time ago, we suggested DNA libraries. Yeah, why aren't you have a store in DNA on every one of your cats you've ever produced? You ever never know when you want to go back and say, hey, I think this uh, problem started with this cat. Buckle swabs, put them in an envelope, put them in a drawer. But remember, if you have them in a drawer, doesn't mean I can use them, but you still should be doing buckle swabs and, and keeping a DNA library on all your cats. Um, have we looked at vaccine associated sarcomas? No, but that is another reason of why we want to make the high density DNA array is that we can start, that's gonna be a complicated issue because it's not more or less common within a breed. It affects cats all over the place. So we need a DNA array that will work for random bred moggy cats. And that's why we're making it and uh, uh, vaccine associated sarcomas would be a wonderful project uh, to try to try on that, on that array. Let's see. Okay, more about the calculations of the heterozygosity. Is it better to measure to use than the inbreeding coefficients? Um, I think so. I think it's better to use genetics to determine your heterozygosity than to use pedigree-based inbreeding coefficients because pedigrees are always wrong. What? And you can never go all the way back, all right? So oh. you can never go back to the beginning. You can't just suddenly say, okay, I'm just gonna go back to eight generations. No, you gotta go all the way back to the dawn of time in order to get the true inbreeding coefficient. And, um, I've even had mistake litters in my cat colony and stuff. So one little weasel in the wood pile there messes up all the calculations for your inbreeding coefficients. So now there are places that will do heterozygosity values like Mars. Mars Wisdom Health will uh, calculate um, heterozygosity values for you. So I think with what we can do today, it's, it's better to actually use genetic markers. And I suggest this to the species survival plans for wild felids too. It's better to do it that way than to use these pedigree drawing programs at this point in time. Well, Doc, I hate to say this. I just got a couple of texts. Hey, Carrie. Uh, from a physician, an ER physician, and a cat breeder friend of mine who said she would sit here all day and uh, type questions and have you answer them. But I do want you to like 
go find silver and vaccine related well, sarcoma. Uh, to, today, <laughs> oh, today, less ago. today's my win foundation day. So, oh, um, yay. so if, you tell me you where, you know go. where to go. I, uh, you know, I came into work today because my, I, you know, we're all sequestered at home and <laughs> I've been able to do a lot of things at home. Uh, but my neighbor is starting to build his house. Oh. So I don't want to go home because all I hear is his, uh, is his backhoe going all day so well, um, who is your neighbor <laughs> he's a well yeah he's he's building a house next door to me and stuff so uh so all there. right well i don't want watson mad at me that you ain't home when you need to be so okay we'll keep if you're good if you're cool okay. well, that's good yeah I'll, i'm gonna stay on with you dr Lyons. This okay is Virginia. all right all right is an aqua or light green eye color and almost blue uh, well, I would call aqua almost blue. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sh I'm not sure how to answer that one. Um, I think it's a like a fancy question because uh, sometimes you know judges will be judging a cat and say, I don't think this is blue. I think this is an aqua. I don't think this is green. I think it's aqua. And it's a subjectivity question. So yeah. I, I I don't know that you could answer that genetically. Right. Yeah. 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 I would call aqua almost blue. Yeah. <laughs> but I just, you know, I just put aqua marine in my lake so that to make it look blue. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, we answered that. So I want to move backwards here a little bit, make sure we haven't um, missed a few talks. Um, just while you're looking back over those, I just want to remind everybody that all of the questions are going to be part of the recording that, that Dr. Lyons answers. Um, so when you listen to the recording later, you will get to hear all of that. Um, the recording goes all, all the way until we end the webinar. So yeah, yeah, yeah we still we still have over half the uh, attendees here. So I, I think we'll keep asking questions. Um, what is known about the heredity of hip dysplasia? Um, not not so much. I mean, you would think they had answered this question a long time ago in in dogs, and they haven't been able to. And they have very, you know, they use OFA, they read radiographs all the time, they try to breed mild dogs to mild dogs. And um, still, I am not aware, but I haven't checked the dog literature lately, of any specific mutations uh, that show risk for hip dysplasia. So for cats, I've always been a little skeptical of this in cats, that uh, show me the cat, the young cat, that has severe hip dysplasia, you know, a cat that needs a, a femoral head replacement. Uh, do we really have hip dysplasia in cats? What I do know is that if you make a young cat put too much weight and make a cat grow too quickly, just like they did with the dogs. So I'm thinking Maine Coon cats here where look at my six year old male, look how big he is. That may not be where we want to go. You might not want the biggest and the heaviest Maine Coon cats when these cats are still young and developing. Um, so that might exasperate a little bit of hip dysplasia. But I'm not a hip dysplasia expert, um, but I don't, uh, I don't even know of any genetic projects for hip dysplasia in cats right now. Um, what is known about cryptorchidism? Nothing that I know of yet, but that too would be very interesting if um, if we could design a project around that. That's that's a very interesting type thing because like uh, Florida Panthers got all inbred and the first thing started to happen with them is they became crypt orchid. And um, so that is something that there you go, something breeders should be aware of if if a kitten's t testicles haven't descended rather quickly and then you know you perpetuate breeding that cat because its testicles have but it they came down at six eight months maybe that's not the right thing to do and so um when the testicles descend they they should be there fairly quickly in a kitten and um so those are other things that you have to manage as well. Uh, it, it could very well be uh, some type of something genetic with cryptorchidism, but you'd have to be very careful about actually how would you make sure this cat's cryptorchid, this cat isn't and stuff. I know we can do it by palpation, but you have to be very good at what you're doing as well. 
There were some nope. uh, breeders uh, in the early 90s that kind of decided it was um, uh, a dominant gene because they noticed that when they bred a cat who had been cryptorchid that dropped late, um, but nobody ever followed up. Like, I don't know, were you in college still? Why didn't they send those cats to you, Doc? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you never know. Uh, a question from Gail about uh, HCM. So, uh, yeah, HCM is found in all breeds of cats, uh, many breeds of cats, and is found in random bred cats as well. We always, it's very interesting to go to uh, ACVIM and listen to uh, cardiology uh, presentations because, you know, not all the cardiologists agree with what the definition of HCM is. So when you say, oh, we're seeing that 15% of domestic cats might have HCM, oh, I'm not so sure about that. So we have to be very careful with the diagnosis as well. Uh, but will there be HCM in, in just our random break cats? Uh, probably, absolutely. Uh, anything can occur in, in, in any uh, particular breed of cats. I skipped over a question from 256. I apologize for Doc that asked about has there been any insight into um extremeness and size difference in cat breeds like the largest Maine Coon versus the smallest cat uh, as compared to what we know about uh, morphological differences in Persian uh, head shapes and Siamese head shapes right they that there again very nice study for the new high density DNA array I'd love to put a bunch of Singapore's on there versus a bunch of uh, Maine Coon cats and see if we could find anything associated like they did in the dog studies with um, uh, several of the genes that we know are in, involved with growth and stuff. So um, that would be a, a very nice project to do as well. Uh, the ragdoll, uh, we, we do have a study on ragdolls with one kidney and one uterine horn. We are actually chasing up a mutation on that and uh, but we also will back it up for probably trying to put some of those cats across the high density array as well and um, so we we do have a candidate that we're looking at and the problem with that is trying to get the student in to get the research done and oh, so, uh, so, so they, if people donate to you directly through your website at the university of missouri which you can find at lionslab.edu or they can text cat c-a-t-s to 833-985-2287 and uh we can just give dr Lyons a whole herd of assistance so that we find out a lot of stuff it real takes quick. a herd yeah that's the problem is is getting the herd to stay together and, and getting them all uh stuck in there and everything so yeah so what we have to be careful with the um with the um, ragdoll study is that we need to make sure that the male cats in the project actually have both testes as well. And, um, and usually you kind of figure that out pretty quickly as well. And, and you should be able to palpate for um, their kidneys as well. Let me, let me turn the phone on and off. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'll say that, uh, let's see, I see a question about, um, uh, hernias and cleft palates. I think I saw something. Like so we're going to get to you. I'm going to ask her when she comes back. Hey, Doc, do you know if there are any genetic tests occurring uh, to identify genes related to cleft palates? Um, no, because we, we don't have actually a large group of uh, cats that have uh, cleft palates. And um, so uh, you always need a population to start with as to um i can't get this turned off that's all right as to um uh to in order to study in the first place and I so always I'm... it's it's great to start with a breed because then you think you, you're one step towards definitely knowing something's genetic but cleft palate is a midline closure defect right mm -hmm. so if it's a midline closure defect all kind of little subtle things can disrupt that so it, it can be a disruption in the uterine environment if the queen has uh, a, a fever or gets a viral infection poor nutrition so a lot of these things can cause uh, midline closure defects so you have to be again very careful of what things we think are actually genetic uh, before you try to go off on one of these studies. And we are at $1,285 in donations. If we just get another 
$215, we'll get all that dough and Mr. Rogers' neighbor, I mean, Dr. Lyons' neighborhood will be great for another year. That's somebody trying to text you the money right now, Doc. I, yeah, it could be. I don't know. <laughs> Does that work? Oh, no. Nope. Can't get this to turn off. But um, I think they're. I think that maybe they're on and they're sure I'm here and they think I'm going to pick up the phone. <laughs> um, are births, uh, birthing hernias a genetic or random trait? Again, so... Um, hernias umbilical hernias are a midline closure defect as well and so again they could be genetic or it could be an environmental trait if you're receiving something repeatedly from the same breeding then um then i you know i always say once okay twice far more suspicious three times, I, I think we got something genetic going on. That doesn't mean three kittens in one litter because maybe the disruption in the queen occurred and it affected that whole litter. So um, I always, unfortunately, kind of need repeat breedings before we go down the line of thinking something is a heritable trait. So right at the top, first thing you have to do is good epidemiology. That means trying to figure out, you know, you do your best to figure out this is not genetic. And if you end up, if you've eliminated everything, that's when you start looking at, try to, to see if something is a genetic problem. Cool, well, thank you Tika and Dr. Elsie's for sponsoring this. Roanne Fulkerson, Gina Zaro, thank you. And uh, we've got another question about, I just looked it up, acromegaly. Uh, I don't know if you pronounce that, is that genetic? Acromegaly, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a uh, endocrine problem. It's often associated, I think, with um, the diabetic cats as well. And so if I'm right about that, is it genetic? Well, we, we do think that uh, diabetes is somewhat genetic, but a complex trait. And so um, do we then, how do we focus on complex traits? Again, high density array, or you have to sequence a whole bunch of individuals, which is generally people haven't done that. They've done generally exome sequencing. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's uh, nothing that I know of from the genetic point of view as far as a study has been done, but it certainly uh, could be put into that category. Yeah. Uh, MayoClinic.com says it's usually caused by non-cancerous tumor. But maybe that's Wikipedia, who knows? Um, so believe what she just said. Jessica Petras just asked me, uh, is a hairline uh, or a hair rosette or a cowlick along the spine line par part of a possible midline defect? Um, we wouldn't call it a midline defect, but it's maybe part of a um, spina bif bifida uh, defect. So closure of the spine, uh, during embryogenesis. And so um, that historically has, yeah, been associated in humans. So, um, so yes, uh, that could be a very, very mild, and maybe it doesn't do anything, but mm -hmm. it could uh, represent a spinal closure defect in uh, an animal. We, we certainly know that in other animals and in humans as well. Yep. I have lots of projects going on. How do I prioritize them? I prioritize them based on uh, a couple different factors. First off, the thing that goes top of the list is because historically I've had NIH funding and the idea is to help human health as well. Historically, we've tried to focus on diseases that um, could help human health and so always diseases are at the top of my list, right? And um, so like ragdolls with one uterine horn and a missing kidney, that's, that's a significant consequence for a mammal. So that certainly would help um, reproductive health in humans. So um, really any diseases in a cat are very important to humans. But another thing that helps me is can I get funding? Can I keep that funding consistent? And do the breeders participate? 
often people will ask me about a project and it's like, well, gee, I haven't seen a sample on that project for two years. So I'll get, generally what happens is there's a couple breeders that get upset about something and want to find the answer. They participate, they try to rally the troops, but maybe not all the troops like them. And so the rest of the <laughs> troops ignore them, right? And, um, and the project just kind of then falls apart. Or She's people close just to say, home here. yeah, or people <laughs> just say, hey, I, I gave some samples and it's like, well, did you have more cats that you produced? Well, keep sending those samples. So we, just like amyloidosis, we have less than 20 cats with amyloidosis. You know, there's more, way more oh, yeah. out there, right? Yeah. And um, the thing is, so we think we have risk factors, but we need larger populations to be able to go in and say and put some real numbers to those different risk risk factors. So we might be able to find something, but we have to be st statistically significant with something. So um, often uh, my priorities are set by you, the breeders. If you're not donating money and if you're not sending in samples, then I don't think that's a high priority for you. And I think that's... Uh, um a place where cat enthusiasts, feline enthusiasts, particularly those of us associated with uh, registries of any kind, whether your letters start with a C or a T or an A or whatever, um, that you can really make a difference um, by making sure that as many cats as you register with your association, you're that involved with the scientific endeavors to find out what makes them special and how to keep them all healthy. Um, it shouldn't be that Dr. Lyons is having to scratch or beg for samples or even funding when we know it exists. This is a perfect time. There are no cat shows where we can send pictures and samples of our cats and really be appreciated. Uh, but instead of getting a ribbon, we find out uh, a new test that we can test our cats for to keep the populations healthier. Looks like we have a male Maine Coon late to start working approximately 20 months and a son who is 17 months and no interest in the girls yet. Wait, genetic, wait, what kind of job does he have? Genetic or coincidence? I, I'm thinking working means uh, talking to the girls and uh, and uh, getting some kittens going on there, right? So 20 months. Well, on the one hand, I've heard people say, well, my cat isn't going to stop growing until it's two months of age and, and Maine Coons don't mature until later. So um, is that part of it? Uh, shouldn't shouldn't be. So I, I would be a little suspect. Um, absolutely. So is that genetic or not? Uh, that's that's really kind of hard to say right from the right from the get-go because it also depends on uh, what's going on with the females as well or do you have these two cats together is there a dominance going on so there is a social castration that um, the dominant male basically um, dominates and the other guy kind of backs off and he kind of will shut down his sperm production a little bit so if you have too many males in in the house you might have a few of them uh, not being as um, Productive. showing their secondary yeah showing their secondary sexual characteristics as much because um they're basically a social castrate and and i'd also point out to any breeders uh facing this issue to not uh completely disassociate it from husbandry and if you have a cattery that is all in your basement there is no natural light we know that cats are really photodynamic and respond to light um so if they don't get natural light, that will affect it. I personally have had lots of cats that um, seem to be slow and mature. And if I have a father who doesn't really breed consistently till two, I notice that his sons don't really breed consistently till two. So they're, but they're also in the same environment. So I wouldn't necessarily call it all genetic, but I certainly wouldn't rule out the inherited aspects of that, but in the environment where they live. Like Dr. Top Lyons was talking about her cat colony, about um, you know all of the things that have to be the same, food and care, uh, consistent, be able to say if something is genetic or not. Yep. Because so the agromegaly and microphthalmia, uh, what we need to realize if we have shown that 
these conditions can be heritable. Uh, so if you've seen that they're heritable in humans or mice or dogs, then absolutely they could be heritable in a cat as well. But it all comes down to the first thing you're kind of looking for, is this occurring in a breed and more than once, right? And so um, that gives you a high hallmark that, hey, this might be a heritable factor. So you, you have to look for, is it commonly occurring? Now, I just mentioned precision medicine. We're hoping to be able to sequence one-off individuals, random bred cats that we think might have a health problem. Well, there's more to uh, defining these conditions. So we need to have good veterinary workup to say, huh, do we have agromegaly here or, or small eyes, microphthalmia? Uh, do we think that's gonna be a heritable condition here? Um, then, then we would consider sequencing it, but, but we have to have good veterinary workup as well, not just a big cat. Right? Do we have a big cat that also is showing that it has some hormone problems as well? Um, that's that's when, when we would start thinking about it. And and like I said, that's why some of these projects fail is sometimes they're not genetic whatsoever. Um, but hopefully when you see these things, if you're seeing it more than once, that's when you start shifting uh, it's genetic instead of random chance. Remember the slide I put up, one in 100 people born have some weird abnormality or so. So um, genetics genetics does happen and there are a lot of mutations that are occurring. If it's one in 100 human births, it might as, it could very well be one in 100 uh, cat births as well. Yeah. Can you genetically influence the length of hair? People have asked me this question. I was like, what difference does it make? But this is a good question for you. You breed an M3 mutation to an M4 mutation, both long hair mutations. Which one is more dominant? Uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, so uh, we don't have all those combinations. And you need, again, uh, you need the cats to be under the same uh, conditions, yeah. health conditions. So you gotta be faithful, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we know temperature affects hair length, right? So they got to be all with the same temperature, the same amount of grooming and stuff like that. So there's things you have to control. Um, but just like russet and amber, it'd be very cool to see what kind of mutations we have with M3. And so we named them M1, 2, 3, 4. Um, but um, we don't have all different combinations of those to say, like, why do Persians, all three hair coats are long? But yeah. that's not true for many of the other breeds where just the top coat is long. What's going on there? Um, is that the same gene, FGF5? Or is that some other gene that causes the undercoats to be long? Um, so that hasn't been discovered yet. That's a good question. And Wendy Haddon, this is just a quarter of my cat book, but I've moved a couple of times since I started buying them. And they're all actually a result of uh, taking I-270 to visit Dr. Lyons when she was at NIH because there was a place <laughs> called Wonder Books in Frederick, Maryland that uh, sold used books. So many of these books, uh, all of the CFA yearbooks I have uh, were for sale for like $3 as used bookstores. And any cat book I ever see, I always buy. Yeah. Uh, so Powell City of Books in uh, Portland and Wonder Books in Maryland. Uh, thanks, Dr. Yeah. Lyons. Is yep. there anything in Missouri? Uh, as far as bookstores? Yeah, for it's good called, It's called Google now, you know. <laughs> you, can, you can Google things and you can find these uh, really cool old bookstores. Uh, what's the one? It's up in uh, Washington, I think. That's... Uh, a uh, really cool bookstore that, uh, so I, I often go on and I'm often looking for old uh, books. Like, um, I'm sure people don't have this Paul Lehausen book I have, and that's that's a very pricey commodity on cat behavior and stuff. Um, uh, half my books are at home now because- You mean I, this one, Doc? Cat Behavior by Paul yeah, Lehausen? there you go, there you go. I have yeah. two copies. And you have two I copies. Have a documentary it's all in german unfortunately yeah of a woman who uh visited this, max plank this niels peterson uh one is a pretty hot commodity too actually oh that's a great one yeah so if anybody has a question that we have skipped over powell books yes um if 
we have skipped over. Please re-ask it. Um, liver shunts. Liver shunts in any particular breed? I have heard about liver shunts in Burmese. And um, so I, I have wondered actually whether uh, Burmese might have a genetic uh, cause for um, ah, Burmese. for uh, liver shunts. Huh. So um, how many, the question becomes, how many have you seen? And, um, and uh, so absolutely we know uh, shunts can be a genetic cause. And uh, so it could be um, a condition. Uh, but again, it just comes down to whether we can get enough individuals. And with these case control studies, you know, if we could, who knows how powerful this DNA array might be. So I would be comfortable if we could say, if we had 10 cases, 10 controls, let's give it a whirl. With Burmans or Burmese, those cats being so inbred, maybe we could do it with five uh, five cases and five controls. So that's pretty low. So it, it'd be worth, you know, we have to do some trials on this DNA array to see how good it would be. Uh, good question, Lorna. Doc, do you see yeah. that one? Uh, would it be possible to build a new graph showing genetic health of various breeds with the new data we've collected through businesses like Optimal Selection? Okay. So uh, yes and no. Um, so when we did our study, what is very, very important is when you do these population studies is that you have to make sure we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to select cats for every one of those populations that we did. Um, first, we made the decision of which breeds are specific to the US and which breeds like Korots, they share with everybody. So we took a Korot sample from anywhere in the world where um, other breeds we felt like, you know, these breeds in the United States, they're different from the UK mm -hmm. or they're different from Europe because Europe went through the world wars. The United States was pretty protected and their cat breeding still went on, but that kind of slowed down. And then after the wars, they had to reconcoct their breeds. So you got to be careful with, are you looking at USA cats versus cats of the whole world? Um, so you have to consider these other things. And, and you also have to consider you want to sample the entire breeding population as much as you can. And um, so that means all the samples can't come from you and your friends. So really, at most, maybe one or two samples should come out of any one given cattery. And you have to represent as many catteries as possible. And then also, we spent a tremendous amount of time going through the pedigrees of every sample we did to make sure we didn't have any common parents or any common grandparents. If you don't do all that, you are biasing the answer that you will get for heterozygosity, it'll be too high or too low. And so that's what I worry about. And I've talked to Mars about this with their optimal selection is they take all their cats and, and uh, produce the number for it. But um, you have to be very careful with that type of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And um, so can it be done? Yes, but it takes a lot of, um, scientific consideration of which cats to actually say what is the base population and it you know so what I worry about is it's too new yet maybe in time you will have contributions from everybody so I encourage that I, I greatly encourage that but um, I'm a little worried right now that uh, the sampling might just be people that are just keen on it so it might be one breeder and a group of their friends um, mm -hmm. So you just have to be careful with that. Can it be done? Absolutely. And um, hopefully it should be done. And I think getting buy-in from as many people and eliminating all of those, um, I don't know, perhaps you found cat breeders can be a bit catty and eliminating all of those catty aspects out of the science of keeping a breed alive and viable makes it so much better. I'm really proud that uh, we've got over 500 Bengals from 17 countries as part of that uh, particular test, but there's nothing stopping all the breeders who want to participate from in the science part, 
from providing your samples to Leslie, from the researchers doing the scientific part, and then buying the test later when it's available. Right, right. Bimetal Siberians, is that like we call dabbling in Japanese bobtails? Well, the question <laughs> is, I don't know what dabbling is. So if, uh, if, you, if you had noticed that cat that I put yes. up, actually that was a cat that had a bobtail because we brought a Japanese bobtail. Uh, uh, Jennifer Redding helped us get a Japanese bobtail into our colony when I was at Davis. We were putting in diversity and we were also that helped us find the bobtail um, mutation which is different from Manx and you'll see that that one cat has uh, Orion was his name. Orion had a part where he didn't look like he was silver and was very intense orange and then other areas he wasn't. So that was I'm, I'm, cat. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking yeah I'm thinking that's that's what it is. Um, so I just kind of explained uh, genetic diversity projects. Uh, we can do them with just buckle swabs as far as money. Uh, you know, we won't do them like we used to do with STRs. Now we'll do uh, uh, SNPs and, and DNA arrays and stuff. So we you'd kind of have to start the whole project all from the beginning because you need to compare apples to apples and make sure, but uh, with the new density DNA array, the projects that we did before, we made sure we used all the same SNPs that are on the new DNA array too, so that we'd be able to compare some of that information. Uh, so what you need to do those studies, buckle swabs on cats, and you need to have um, the ped pedigrees back at least five generations so you can select the right cats. IBD seems to be on the rise. Mm. Yeah, this is a tricky one. Is it more common in specific breeds? I don't know. IBD and Bengal cats. What do you think, Anthony? <laughs> I've seen a lot of diarrhea in Bengal cats. I might have some on me now. But uh, there's an awful lot of causes for its origin. Um, and husbandry plays a big part. But also, uh, this relates to all the other things. Don't separate the genetics from the actual care of the cat and good veterinary care and examination because um, a genetic exam or a whole genome sequencing won't tell you if trichocomonas is present or if your cat is somehow more, you have giardia. You need to be working in concert with your veterinarian and not choosing genetic testing over consult with your veterinarian and good physical exam. Those two things have to work together. Right. But yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, so we, we do know that Giardia seems to be a little bit higher in Bengal cats. And and so again, you know, you're combining a cat that's 6 million years apart in evolutionary time. And, our, and what we have to keep in mind is commercial cat diets have only come into play since about the 1950s or so. Sure. So we're actually giving cats diets that they have not evolved with. And uh, so... I'm not surprised by IBD whatsoever because I think a lot of times if you give the cat a mouse, but now also I don't, <laughs> I'm not a veterinarian, so I, I don't, uh, I don't want to go too far out on a limb here, but definitely with us working with Bengal cats, um, if we give them mice on occasion, so dead mice that have come from calling of mice colonies that are very clean mice and stuff, um, we see IBD kind of clear up. So mm -hmm. now can everybody do that? No, but it's it's definitely nutritional. Um, I always worry how much does IBD then live uh, lead to lymphosarcoma? Mm -hmm. So something I, that's kind of something I've been interested in but never developed a project on. So- um, And I certainly noticed and seen uh, cats that I've had a really difficult time with diarrhea, catteries that I've visited and have really difficult times with diarrhea, you know, that continues. And is that as a result of some, a group of inherited traits that they are passing along down to their kittens and how they uh, can process the commercial food they're feeding or the raw food they're feeding, or is it related to, uh, you know, the uh, 
ectoparasites that their cats are being exposed to. It's worth investigating. So uh, in order to do that, don't forget to text CATS to the number you see somewhere on the screen. Yeah, and don't we're going to keep going until we get all the money. Voting. <laughs> so right. if we don't get all the money, we're not we'll blocked here. off. So, you know, we still have 94 people listening to us uh, talk about cats. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, Right. So uh, a question about vitiligo. Yeah, if, if we skipped over your question, please ask it again, just because the list is getting long and it's hard to talk and read at the same time. So here's a question about vitiligo in a Bengal cat. And uh, vitiligo is definitely a heritable disease, but also a complex disease because uh, in humans, it's an autoimmune disease, actually. So it sounds like you have a couple cats with uh, some pigment loss now so first off before we do anything I'd say make sure you get to a good dermatologist and try to figure out is there something else going on with your cat here and uh, before we start uh, thinking about vitiligo and vitiligo in humans is very common where it starts around the creases of the eyes and in the mouth and in the crease of the uh, arms and you'll see it at the knuckles so uh, it has a very particular presentation and so it'd be interesting to see how it would present in a cat um, but uh, I, I don't, no one's ever come forward uh, for, for a vitiligo project uh, in the cats. I've kind of wondered is the reverse points that we're seeing in the Carpati cats, is that vitiligo? Um, so that's, that's kind of made me wonder. Um, I do my best to always try to match something up to something and because the candidate gene approach is still a very valid approach. So we'll do, do our best to do that. Um, no work at the present time on modifier genes for the tint of lilac or colors uh, or the color spectrum. So kind of mentioned that about um, um, the different shades of blue or gray in cats. Um, are stenotic nares dominant or recessive? That I have no idea, but definitely if you're breeding for cats that have a very short face, Along with that, you're going to get very uh, small nasal passages as well. So do yourself a favor and try to breed for a longer face cat would be my first thought. And uh, Daryl Newkirk uh, asked about, uh, he just wanted to confirm this doc. Maybe he's going to go look for some. I'm just joking, Daryl. Hi. Uh, that <laughs> DNA is only carried in the white cells. That's right. That's right. The, 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 well, no, not only in the white cells. It's in every cell of our body. It's not in red blood cells, right? So in humans, other species it is, um, uh, particularly birds, have nucleated red cells, but humans do not. So our red cells, once they mature, so they're produced in the bone marrow, and once they mature, they uh, get rid of their nucleus, and then they circulate for maybe seven, eight, uh, two weeks, uh, seven, eight days to maybe two weeks, and then they, they get replenished. So um, it's not always the same red cells in your body circulating. So every other cell of your body has a nucleus and has DNA, not the red cells. And uh, the white cells are just such a small proportion of a blood sample. That's why, you know, I might be asking for three mils of blood, but it's I'm not getting three mils of DNA uh, there. Well, that's great. And we are now at $1,360. So we just need $140 more to uh, <laughs> reach our goal here and get that matching fund of $1,500. And you can text CATS to 833-985-2287. And actually that funding is coming from Kelly Bischoff, uh, who is on the Wind Feline Foundation Board of Directors, who decided she was so excited about this topic and Dr. Lyons and wanted to engage all of the people who would listen. Uh, so she put up $1,500 and said, if uh, we raise that much, she'll match it. So thank you, Kelly. And please keep sending your money or um, Dr. Lyons, is CBD yeah. for pets becoming popular? Are there any evidence of its benefits genetically? 
<laughs> uh, but yeah, give them catnip. If you want to get your cat high, <laughs> give it some catnip. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I am a geneticist, so I uh, do not know about giving that drug to your cat, what it'll actually do, or uh, I, I don't know, know anything about that, actually. But I, this is a good question. I get a fair amount, actually, yeah. regarding yeah. Um, pyruvate kinase deficiency. Um, mm -hmm. They test their main Coons, and they uh, have one who's a PK deaf carrier. How yeah. do you feel about keeping this cat in their breeding program? Do you think PK deaf, um, the clinical presentation affects all cats the same? I'd love to get your feedback on it. Yeah, so that's that's that PK deaf has been a very interesting one. One, I've had people confuse polycystic kidney de disease, PKD, with PK deaf. And so some people have actually gotten the wrong test done. Um, but pyruvate kinase deficiency, we uh, we tend to see that when they're, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be as penetrant as it used to be with like the Abyssinian cats mm -hmm. that it was first found in, right? And so this mutation is very interesting because it's in the middle of an intron. Remember, most, most mutations I've said affect the coding regions. Well, this mutation is in the middle of the intron and we see that it affects splicing of the transcript and when it affects the splicing, that's when it can um, uh, can cause disease. But it doesn't always affect the splicing. And um, it is associated with more stress. The more stress you have in the individual, then uh, perhaps you will see uh, more problems with PK, uh, PK deficiency. We found this quite to be a, a frequent uh, mutation in Bengal cats. Absolutely. And and we had breeders working with us and we said, you know, any any weird things going on in your cats? We we want to see that. But we had a hard time finding homozygote cats for pyruvate kinase deficiency. So we were never able to collect the data that we need uh, to actually show these types of things. So this is one of the nice things we kind of want to do with uh, VGL and Mars and whoever else wants to participate is start publishing information on allele frequencies for these different mutations in different populations. So how do I feel about it? It's kind of on, see, you noticed on that slippery slope slide mm -hmm. that that PKLR, that's the pyruvate kinase deficiency mutation. I kind of had that in the middle. What do we do about things like that? And what I need to emphasize is you have to weigh all these things in your breeding population. Is PKLR, the only mutation I have there, is it in my main cat? Is it just in some other cat? Um, what are the good aspects about my cat? This is a really beautiful cat. He has a good temperament. He breeds well. I never have to do anything, interact with him. Um, that's another thing, you know, reproduction in cats. You shouldn't have to be there to watch your cats <laughs> give birth. You shouldn't have to touch any of those kittens and the more you do, bad, all right? So, exactly. uh, right, you're perpetuating not good queens and stuff. So with PKLR, I kind of put that on, honestly, on the lower list of what I would try to manage in the population. You have to be careful with it. Like I was saying about the CYP290 mutation, what if in the next cat, it does cause a bad health problem? So we do know it can be associated with a health issue, but um, but it's it's a trickier mutation that it doesn't seem like when it was in the Abyssinians it was clearly causing health issues, mm -hmm. but now we see it in the Bengal cats and in in other Oriental Singapore type breeds, uh, yeah, and absolutely. Singapore's and so uh, and now this is a Maine Coon cat so. I, I would be less worried about PKLR than about other health aspects of the cat. Good answer. And I mean, I think Dr. Lyons alluded to it a little earlier that um, sometimes pedigrees can be suspect. And we know that you know, not all Maine Coon started out as cinnamon. Um, and as new colors are introduced that we know originate other breeds, sometimes we know that 
those colors come from people breeding those cats together, getting breeding uh, cinnamon Abyssinians to uh, British shorthairs to get cinnamon British shorthairs. And even though if that information isn't on a pedigree, but we see with our own eyes a color that only came from a different breed, it's not to get mad about it, but to take action, to test for all the things that we can so we keep the population healthy, even if we want to keep a color that came from someplace else. Is genetic testing advisable in stray and feral mutts? Oh, that's a good question. That were born with congenital defects like microphthalmia. Um, well, the thing is, uh, you would have to, um, there's no test for microphthalmia. So it's not, you can't do any genetic test that's going to help you there. So if you have feral cats with this condition, and and for some reason, if you're interested in maybe using those cats in a breeding program, then yeah, then we could maybe do whole genome sequencing to see if we could find a mutation that within this group of cats is associated with microphthalmia. Um, we have definitely done that already. We have found um, a Neiman pick, uh, which is a lysosomal storage disease in a random bred cat. We genetically tested one cat. And why we did that is because, well, we had a diagnosis of a lysosomal storage disease, but there's a half a dozen genes that cause that. And the breeder didn't want to do any more genetic tests or didn't want to do any more testing in the vet hospital. So we thought, well, let's let's give this a whirl. Let's see if we can find it genetically. And we did. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, with Neiman pick, pick type 1, there's only experimental um, therapies. And so the breeder, uh, the owner, wasn't even a breeder, the owner chose not to do any other follow-up. But that proved that precision medicine will work. We just found a new condition uh, in a random bred cat that is uh, similar to Batten's disease in humans and in dogs. Mm. So uh, we do have examples where we have sequenced one off random bred cat and found a genetic mutation that causes that problem. It's wow. always helpful to do more than one cat or to do a parent offspring combination or a little trio. So in humans, the standard of care is to do hum whole exome sequencing and to do the trio, the uh, the offspring and the two parents, but um, but it can be done with one off cat as well. Yep, and that's what we hope to be put forward for precision medicine for cats, which has been funded by the Wind Feline Foundation. Yay! Now uh, you had a question here about cerebral hypoplasia um, and and a a connection with panleukopenia and about uh, utero injury and vaccination of the queen during the course of pregnancy. Are yeah. you familiar with that, Doc? Yeah, so we actually have uh, three or four cats in uh, the 99 Lives Project that are um, phenotyped as cerebellar hypoplasia. And the thing is, as you mentioned, it can be caused by a host of things. And so that's what we have to, to work out. Uh, I think in one cat, we have a good candidate gene that could be the cause, uh, but in other cats, we have nothing. So that becomes the tricky thing. And that becomes where you have to really work with a neurologist now to try to weed out all the different possible causes of why you would have this condition. And it takes due diligence, you know, whole genome sequencing is not a magic bullet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to skip all the veterinary workup. And, and I won't do it because in the end, I want to publish paper that says, I found this mutation, here it is, is the cat still intact? Could we use this uh, as a biomedical model? Um, you know, there's there's all kind of different things we could do. Can we actually do a treatment that's useful? Um, so if somebody wants to skimp on, well, I, I don't want to do all the neur neurological workup, just sequence my cat for me, because yeah, it might be cheaper. Uh, that's that's really not what we're trying to promote with precision medicine. Mm -hmm. We still want good health care for the cats. You can't skip over good veterinary care and just use genetics. 
and they go hand in hand. Which on amyloidosis, are we building a reference library? Can she send in samples or the breeders who work with Abbeys and Siamese where amyloidosis is, is an issue? Send yeah. in um, freezed, frozen samples of their cats, of those buckle swabs to you to build right. a library. Yeah, well, buckle swabs don't uh, need to be frozen, uh, frozen right? Uh, so anybody can always be building up a DNA library for, for their cat. So we call it a DNA bank uh, for their cats. The, the problem is with amyloidosis, as, as you're aware, that to put a cat into a case, you have to have definitive pathologic workup, meaning Congo red staining, to say that cat is affected. And then now how do you get your controls? because cats get amyloidosis at different ages. So it's trickier with the Abyssinians because they can be a little bit older before they get amyloidosis. And there's other things that can cause amyloidosis as well. So um, like when we did the amyloidosis study, I thought we were gonna find a hit with the Siamese because this is a very early onset disease, very severe amyloidosis, affects the liver, causes the liver to be friable, it um, can rupture and the cat bleeds out. That's very distinctive. That's sometimes you don't need a Congo red to, to actually mm -hmm. say, you know, this cat died of amyloidosis. So the trick with amyloidosis and doing the population study is how do we know cats that are four or five years old, are they gonna develop amyloidosis or not? So that's what makes it hard to figure out what our risk factors are um, because we have to, so for our controls, we try to find the oldest cats we can possibly get and um, that are healthy and say, those are our controls. That's the best thing we can do. Um, so that's, that's what makes amyloidosis a bit tricky. And yes, if you're storing these DNAs, eventually there might be a DNA test and you'll be able to go back and, and test all those cats. So I encourage everybody to have a DNA bank. Oh, awesome. And you know, uh, we got a question here from Rox. Uh, that's a really good one. Is there, uh, do you think a domestic cat is healthier? Debbie asked this question than a pedigree cat because of the higher degree of genetic diversity. Uh, no, uh, because first off, uh, the random bred cat could be a cat that is from a colony or a barn, and those cats have been inbreeding with themselves for, you know, years. Mm -hmm. So a feral colony of cats can be just as inbred as a breed. And in fact, our study that fi found congenita myotonia or myotonia congenita was from a random bred feral population in Winnipeg, Canada. And we found the two cats because of Facebook. One person put their cat up and said, I have this condition in my cat. And another person said, hey, I do too. They didn't, and through Facebook, they found out that they got the cats from the same shelter, which was getting cats from the same um, mm -hmm. frame, Colony, same yeah. park. It was a park, right? Wow. So um, random bred cats can be inbred, and um, but overall they tend to be more diverse. So uh, you kind of expect them to be a little more healthy. Yep. Wow. Uh, uh, is feline infectious peritonitis resistance a reliable genetic test? Uh, there's. Hmm. Say mm. that again. Yeah. Um, is feline infectious peritonitis resistant, FIPR, a reliable genetic test? Well, there's... Again, I'm going to Google it myself, actually. Have you looked at genetic susceptibility to... Oh, this is cystitis. Um, I have not seen that test. Um, so we can test the strain and we do know the genetic mutation that is different from feline coronavirus for feline infectious peritonitis. There are, there is mutations that are um, currently 
thought to maybe have disease resistance or susceptibility to FIV in the gene called APOBEC, but I am not familiar with anything for feline infectious peritonitis resistance. So if you can put in the questions where you are seeing that test, we'll, I'll, I'll try to look it up for you and, and see, what, see what's it, going on with that. It is a lab uh, that's selling a specific test called feline infectious peritonitis resistance. It's a sensor and uh, they utilize, at least on the website, some... Um, uh, is it in Poland? It's in, they offer it in Portuguese, English or Dutch the website, so I, and they utilize the studies that uh, Niels Peterson did in 2009, um, showing polymorphisms in the TNFA and CD209 genes associated with outcome of feline infectious peritonitis. So perhaps they're testing those. Hmm. There are new tests every day. New tests every day. Um, is it a reliable test? This is what you do. You go to a website called PubMed. So you quit using Google and Wikipedia, all right, to oh, find okay. your genetic information. And you go to, so you Google PubMed, right? And you go to PubMed and you uh, start looking for scientific publications on um, that uh, FIP resistance in cats and mutations and stuff. So um, that's, that's that will be what I do once I get offline with you guys, but, um, I, I know nothing about that test and and have recently chatted with Niels and and so I I am skeptical. I am skeptical. Like any good scientist always is. Yep. Uh, so cystitis uh, cystitis in cats. Vic, uh, but this this is a interesting thing that's been renamed about a hundred different times <laughs> and. Um, uh, no, we haven't done any work in that. We are working with uh, Egyptian mouse that uh, seem to pr uh, produce urate stones at a higher frequency than other cats do. So uh, working with uh, Heather Lorimar on, on that. So her, she has a student that will be helping to genetically type a mutation we think we have. And so if you have mouse, send some samples to Heather Lorimar or send them to me and I'll get them to her. Um, but yes, uh, how much is this is a what we would call a complex disease? How much is this associated with stress? And um, and I fully believe there's more stress in our cats than than we ever think. And uh, so I think it is a confounding factor. But um, you know what I would love to find is populations or breeds that. Um, have a higher frequency for this disease that, you know, you have to control for so many things, the stress levels, the diets, um, that that's what makes complex diseases hard. So nothing that I know of as far as uh, going on with uh, genetic research. I know, I know Ten Tony's uh, back now in Davis. I come here and he goes there. I don't know what was going on with that, but uh, <laughs> Tony's one of my favorite people, yeah. Uh, and if for someone who's having trouble uh, sending a uh, donation, I will make sure that we accept your donation in any form you want to send it. Please go to winfelinefoundation.org win and you can send it directly to our website uh, if you can't text uh, CATS to 833 985 Yeah, yeah I, I will look more into this FIP sensor test, but uh, I'm, I'm not thinking that's uh, significant. Any other questions we have to answer here that we skipped over? How do you start a, a DNA bank? Uh, you go get, uh, you can go get, unfortunately everybody needs the DNA, they, they need swabs now for the COVID tests, right? But uh, cytological brushes are my favorite because they dry so quickly and they seem to be a little easier to handle. But if you don't have cytological swabs, go get some a brand new box of Q-tips. Don't get the Q-tips that say, I think there's some Q-tips that say they're antibacterial or something like that. Don't use those. And um, so put Q-tips in your cat's mouth, put it right under the whisker pad. You don't want to jam it back here. 
Um, but any, anything in the cat's mouth is going to work if, if they don't cooperate. And take good swabs. Make sure they dry. Do not put them in plastic. Put them in a paper envelope. Put the pedigree with it so you remember who Bob the cat was uh, five years from now. Put the pedigree, date of birth, and you know some descriptive stuff, and uh, and put it in a drawer and make sure the drawer stays uh, warm and dry. Uh, keep an Excel file that uh, keeps a log of your DNA bank. My DNA bank is a big Excel file. Um, there's probably better ways to do it, but uh, uh, the Excel file just works fine. Um, so that's that's how you start a DNA bank. And I uh, just go around to every cat in the house and you, you could, uh, thing is, do one cat at a time and complete everything before you move to the next cat. When people talk about genetic testing and errors in genetic testing, the biggest error in genetic testing is the submission by the owner, that the owner messes up. And that's that's higher than actually the laboratory messing up. Yeah, well, this is a great yeah. opportunity to thank our good friends at the Cat Fancers Association. I know you mentioned uh, the uh, work that Heather Lorimer, uh, her student, will be doing with the Egyptian Mao. I, know I spoke with Melanie Morgan, who's our judge administrator over there, and she is so excited about the work that you're doing with Egyptian Mao's. And, uh, uh, hopefully finding a clue into their cystitis. We appreciate our friends at CFA. Hello, you guys. And uh, the good folks at Tika and Dr. Elsie's for sponsoring. Yep. Swab samples, should you wait uh, from nursing? Uh, you yeah, know, that's generally a good idea uh, for two reasons. If the cat's been nursing, um, it's, it might have a bit of milk in its mouth and you're going to get that on the swab and, and that's full of nice sugars and everything for bacteria to grow. So, um, so you might want to wait a little bit. And then, of course, there's epithelial cells in the milk from the mother. Um, so if you don't get a good swab of the cat, the uh, kitten's mouth, you might get some contamination uh, mm -hmm. from the mother. So um, it's, it's nice to wait a little bit. Uh, it's safer to do if you, you wait a little bit from the cat's nursing um, to collect the DNA sample. The contamination should be minimal, but, uh, but it, it could actually occur. It could mess up your genetic test. And we just need fifteen more dollars to reach our goal of fifteen hundred dollars on Keep Block Dr. Lyon's Neighborhood Happy. Text CAT C A T S to eight three three nine eight five two. Oh man, this is hard to get fifteen bucks. Come I on. I know this is a lot of work to get fifteen dollars. Do you see how right. much it takes? Thank right. you guys for who all everyone right. who's donated. We really appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you to Kelly Bischoff for uh, donating the matching funds. Right. Why do uh, the different labs not give more stats about the results per breed? Um, that's a that's an interesting question. Just because I think maybe um, it takes another step to keep updating that information and to put it on the web page. So I, I don't think there's anything sinister about it. I think it just takes time to do that, and and um, and then also a lot of people have just never asked. So I know Langford bets has historically always put up information about um, what they're finding in their breeds uh, and in their, their genetic testing. And, and that's something we have encouraged with the other um, laboratories as well. As well. I, it, it just hasn't really been asked much. Some labs might not want to do it because they really might not want to share how much genetic testing they're doing. Right. So they could give you frequencies, but then not the bottom line numbers, but really kind of what you need is that bottom line number. Uh, so we do hope um, Mars has uh, done a good example by uh, presenting some of that data in published form that's on PubMed that, uh, for dogs. And so we're kind to encourage them to do that for cats as well. This is something else coming out of the World's Small Animal Vet Association, which has a genetic health committee that we're trying to uh, um, push standardization mm -hmm. of genetic testing. And so one thing would be to share more information about disease frequencies in different breeds and uh, different worldwide populations. So uh, the breed might have a completely different frequency for a mutation in Australia as compared to the United States. 
So uh, that that information would be quite useful if we could get uh, more labs to labs to sign on for that. It's actually actually kind of a project on my plate right now is to write a paper on CAT standardization of genetic testing and what are some of the things that we can do that would help that. And, and one of those is to present some of the allele frequencies for these health conditions. Yeah, then for those folks who utilize optimal selection by Wisdom Health, they don't publish it on a regular basis that I'm familiar with. Um, we did present a poster uh, at the last conference, but they do keep their website up to date. So if you look at your breed frequency and then the frequency in uh, pedigree cats in general, and then in all cats, that is uh, dated in real time. So as soon as they finish a test and publish the results to the owner, you'll find out how much it compares to your breed. Mm -hmm. I, I see we uh, lost one of our individuals that was asking some questions, and um, that was completely unintentional if we upset that individual. And um, so um, I directly apologize for that, but um, I, I hope that individual is uh, still happy. We answered a whole bunch of questions there. So um, sorry that that individual seems to be a bit upset with um, that we said that person's name during it was our me. conversation. I'm sorry, I was trying to call everybody out. Hi, Stephanie. Is this it? I think we got, hang on, I gotta go check on the totals. If you, if you got, uh, you got one last question, now's your time. Seems like we're slowing down a little bit. Ah, yeah, Bengal polyneuropathy. Uh, so we should uh, try to get uh, Anthony back to talk about this. So I have, we tried to look at Bengal polyneuropathy on the 63K array and we got no signals. So we did not get any hits of an association. Now that can be for various different reasons that um, the, the DNA array itself not, might not be powerful enough or it's a complex trait and we needed more samples. So the samples we did use came from Dr. Diane Shelton. So this is a collaborative project with Dr. Diane Shelton at University of um, California, San Diego. And because we know that she has good phenotype samples and really a neurologist has typed those cats uh, for polyneuropathy. So um, if you know, you're saying this is a huge problem, well, a huge problem, I'm not seeing anybody submit any samples in this regard. So if you know of cats out there, we would love to get them on because we're gonna try to reanalyze this on this high density array, provided we have enough DNA left. Uh, so you never know if we have enough DNA left to try to look at this. So uh, another good project for the high density array, something that failed on the 63K array and nothing jumped out when we sequenced, but we only sequenced one cat that we had enough DNA from. So if there's other cats out there with a good strong diagnosis, we would love to either sequence them and or put them on the high density DNA array. Last call for alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, but uh, a great answer on the polyneuropathy. Yes, I know of a couple of cats where they started the treatment without a very good, um, and they didn't go through the whole process of diagnosis and they responded to the treatment, but they might be some really good cats to work up, get a definitive uh, diagnosis and then send you some blood. Yep. So uh, projects that we're working on, we often have them up on our website. You can, uh, so our website is uh, feline genetics or genomics at uh, UC, at, uh, I almost said UC Davis, at, um, open it up, felinegenetics.missouri.edu. And so that website has a various different projects up that also has a, a lab email that you, we answer all the time now. 
and uh, that has information on if you want to send a buckle swab or a blood sample or a fixed tissue or a frozen tissue. Um, it has how to package that. If you're in a different country, there's a, a letter to customs. You, we can ship DNA samples from cats and tissues all over the place. You just have to have a letter to customs. We don't need import export permits or anything like that. Um, so take a look at our web page and if you don't find what you're looking for, send us an email and, and we constantly answer those emails. Great. And uh, is there a banner you can put on your website for donations to win? Thank you, Lorna. That's a beautiful question. I did not even set that up. Yes, um, in the follow-up email uh, from my colleague, uh, Virginia, uh, Rudd here at uh, Winfield Lyme Foundation. We will make sure you have a graphic uh, with a link for samples. Thank you uh, for doing it. Thank you all to, uh, who participate in CFA, Tika, and who utilize Dr. Elsie's uh, because all of them joined in making sure that this was possible. And have we reached a goal? We did, we just reached our goal. We made $3,000. Good job, everybody. Good job, good job. Uh, still taking samples for silver. We're always taking samples for silver. <laughs> so we're always taking samples for all these projects. And as I mentioned earlier, that's part of the problem is uh, that people tend to peter out over time. And um, so I er always want to encourage people to send in samples. What, what I want to be careful with, though, is you might send in a sample and it might not get used in the project. And so then people expect results from that sample. Well, that would be a huge cost to us to go back and retest every sample we have, say, if we found something. So, you know, there's very particular reasons why we pick particular samples and stuff. So I just want to be clear that you might get results from the study or, or you might not. And we are not a genotyping facility. So a lot of people send us samples and think, oh, they're gonna get all their coat colors done and, and stuff like that. That That's not gonna happen. Um, but a donation of sample for research is exactly that, a donation for research. And um, we might end up giving you an answer of what your cat has, or you just might have to resubmit it to a commercial lab later. So we just can't make that promise. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, I've done a little bit of working with some of the genetics lab and you know, there's a whole process for uh, accepting and going through samples when the goal is to just return results to people. The actual research part is very different than uh, just trying to send somebody results. So there's the analysis, the comparative aspect that Leslie and her colleagues are looking for when they're looking for new things that isn't the same as when you're just sending for a yes or no, is this variant present or not? And uh, yes, we appreciate you keeping keeping up the good work, Doc. So we can just send yep. in. Does this, we'll is this variant here? I'm gonna sit here and look up this uh, FIP testing and see what that's all about. <laughs> that's what I'll do for the rest of the day. <laughs> Well, we made our money, so. <laughs> All right, good deal. Okay, so um, I think we're good. Dr. Lyons, real quick, yeah. this is Virginia. Hi, Virginia. Um, had a couple of people ask where to send their samples to. Uh, you're gonna send the samples to uh, University of Missouri. So again, on our website, it has a hundred different places of what the address is. So it's Columbia, Missouri. It's going to be to my name and uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, the the address is uh, 825 East Campus Loop, Columbia, Missouri, 65211. But plenty of information on our website as to the exact location to send those samples. All right, thank you. I'll get that also added um, probably in the follow-up email. Okay. Um, any uh, genetic tests for non-pedigreed cat? Um, to, uh, UC Davis will do that. So they, they have my database and if you have a non-pedigreed cat, it'll tell you uh, 
uh, the population that it's most uh, likely close to. I, I uh, call them uh, cat races, but it, you could call it a population as well. So you can do that. If your cat is not closely related to a cat breed, it's not going to match a cat breed. So, um, so we don't stretch it as much as the dogs do. Um, uh, uh, that so, uh, and then I think uh, Mars is probably going to develop a test as well soon. So hoping that will come out as well. And uh, for folks uh, who are trying to find Dr. Lyon's website, it's really easy. Uh, it's felinegenetics.missouri.edu. F-E-L-I-N-E-G-N-E-T-I-C-S dot M-I-S-S-O-U-R-I dot E-D-U. And you can go directly to Dr. Lyon's lab, see what she's up to. There are no cat cams, but we're going to uh, fix that camera she's looking into right on her desk so we can always check it on. Just joking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, that'd be awesome, cat cam. <laughs> cat cam. You could, <laughs> that'd be, I, you could charge for that. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I often move my one camera around my house to see what my cats are up to and stuff, and uh, they sleep most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> They're sleeping. They're sleeping. Smart um, cats. Make you work, they sleep. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's there's an RVT here that has an interesting question about some of her cats that she's on. Why don't you? She, you've had a couple different questions on on this chat. Please send us an email, either my email, which is lionsla at missouri.edu, or the lab's email, which is feline genome at missouri.edu, and we'll see if we can uh, do something uh, with your cats. But it's it's going to cost some money, so you have to kind of be prepared for that. <laughs> the gene pool of Siamese cats and all these other cats. Well, I was under the impression that uh, Siamese um, had a very strict gene pool, but they were never the lowest cats as far as our genetic variation. And uh, so now you have these new uh, different types of Siamese coming out, um, uh, the Thai cats as well. Um, so in regards, if you mixed all those cats together, you would probably have a very uh, diverse gene pool, particularly if you're pulling uh, cats from uh, Thailand. You know, that's going to be new additions to the gene pool. That's what I've always pool. hoped Burmese cats would do with the Burmese breeders. I was always hoping traditional would get together with contemporary, would get together with the European cats and start breeding them and maybe mix in a couple different breeds to diversify their population, bring in some cats from Thailand. Um, so I, I don't know where the Burmese have taken their breed at this point in time, but um, you know, uh, mixing up the breeds can be a good thing and you don't have a lot of rules against that. So cat breeders, as compared to dog breeding. So cat breeders should take advantage of that as much as you can. Um, email for me is lions, L-Y-O-N-S-L-A at missouri.edu. Awesome. And uh, let's see. Great, that was your that was your question. When Feline Foundation has an educational committee meeting in about 20 minutes, I'm supposed to head to. And uh, if you want us to do this again, uh, please make sure you let your folks know and continue to support the Wind Feline Foundation so we can keep supporting Leslie's research. Thank you, Terry Lynn. I appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you, Doc. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think we're out of questions here. If you have a, a question that's more particular to the lab, I'm not going to answer that um, on this. And uh, so send a, a lab email and, and we'll get to it. And we will, if you have additional questions, that uh, uh, we'll do our best to answer them and link you to the studies that they're related to and um, continue to try and engage Dr. Lyons in answering your questions when she has the time and when we can support her. Thank right. you, Doc. Have a super afternoon. Yeah, my pleasure. And just remember, if samples come here and there's another researcher doing a project, I'm going to give those samples 
to, I will share those samples. You know, we can't do everything. I know there's a lot of other good researchers going on out there, and I really promote other people doing cat genetics. So I will not, to the best of my ability, not do competitive projects because there's not enough money for that. So um, if uh, there's groups in France and Sweden and Belgium and all over the place that are doing projects, I will um, defer to them if they have an interest in particular disease